This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with James O'Brien. Very good morning to you. It's three minutes after ten and... I hope you were listening yesterday because we're, we're, we're going to be throwing back quite a lot to uh, some of the conversation that we had and, of course, some of the detail contained within Sir Martin Morbick's report. I, I, do you know what? I never know what I'm going to do until the light comes on and sometimes I'm still not entirely clear uh, precisely how we're going to handle things and um, long after the light has come on. But I think we'll take a moment to, to, to give some credit to Sir Martin Morbick. It's funny the stuff that gets overlooked. He'd probably done more to reaffirm faith in public service, public duty, than every single Conservative cabinet minister since 2010. Uh, from where I'm sitting, at least, he has delivered uh, on an extraordinary scale in the face of, a, of a originally a considerable scepticism. He has absolutely no agency over prosecutions, of course, or, um, or arrests. But in terms of the, uh, how far and how deep this inquiry went, I think Sir Martin Morbeck deserves the gratitude of a nation, actually. I really do. I, I, I mean, how often do we find ourselves considering uh, official inquiries inadequate or, 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 or unfit for purpose or grounds for cynicism, scepticism, cover-up, accusations of cover-up? I, 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 look, it took a long time. But compared to other miscarriages of justice or tragedies, avoidable tragedies, it, it was delivered. So thank you, actually, Sir Mar Martin Morbick. We spend an awful lot of time, don't we, on this programme castigating public figures and pointing out uh, inadequacies. Robert Jenrick, for example, a, a former housing minister, uh, is currently the front runner. He, he came first in the first ballot of Conservative MPs, a man best known for ordering the painting over of murals at a processing centre for unaccompanied child refugees. Or um, perhaps perhaps he's best known for that, or perhaps it's for unlawfully help, helping a billionaire to um, secure planning permission for a, for a massive uh, housing project. I don't know. I don't know what your, your best... Rory Stewart, Joey suggests, deserves a bit of credit. Yeah, all right, I'll take him out of that. But although, well, no, because I think Sir Martin Morbick has done more to uphold or to reaffirm faith in public duty than all of them combined. It doesn't mean that none of them did, did anything. So thank you, Sir Martin Morbick. Um, two thoughts, really, carried over from yesterday. Uh, uh, Thomas just mentioned one of them in, in the headlines. Uh, incompetence, greed and dishonesty. Incompetence, greed and dishonesty. Extraordinary. And the other was Dave in Shepherd's Bush, who I know touched a lot of you with the clarity of his contribution as someone um, allied to the tower, someone who knew people in it, someone who um, was hearing a, a, an eyewitness account of what was happening before the news crews had arrived. And Dave said, what if he hadn't written it down? What if the Grenfell Action Group uh, Edward Dufan and uh, Francis O'Connor will be catching up with Edward at some point in the in the coming days, as and when it suits him. But but what if it hadn't been written down? A, a, a portion of the uh, inquiry report focused specifically on how the people trying to draw attention to the problems that contributed to, and in some ways caused the tragedy, were treated with contempt by the tenants man Tenant Management Organisation and secondly, um, the council in, in particular, m at least one member of whom was put in the House of Lords by Boris Johnson. And that is part of what I'm trying to nibble at this morning, that, that sense of why you are or not surprised, what, what, it, what it tells us about the nature of Britain that we perhaps already knew how many people uh, associated with this tragedy have actually seen their fortunes rise or increase. One of the owners of one of the companies is photographed in the newspaper today outside his £3 million mansion. And you sort of think he doesn't seem to have suffered very much uh, as a consequence of actions that the report suggests um, contributed to the tragedy. Some of the detail, of course, that emerged was almost unbelievable. Uh, deliberately faking reports or faking uh, tests to allow them to put stuff on a building that they knew 
could perhaps be unsafe. Baroness Hale is another example. You're absolutely right, Karen, of somebody who has perhaps contributed. And Lawrence reminds us Jacob Rees-Mogg is an example of someone who he didn't contribute to the disaster, but he certainly compounded the misery and the agony of the bereaved by suggesting that everybody who died lacked common sense. Boris Johnson gave him a knighthood. Um, it says something, doesn't it, about Britain, that? What does it say about Britain? A disaster caused by dishonesty and greed. 72 deaths. Every single one of them avoidable. So, how did they happen? They happened because engines of power and privilege were permitted to ride roughshod, not only over the concerns, but ultimately over the lives of ordinary people. Ordinary people. Some little phrases that spring to mind would include elf and safety, as one Daily Mail columnist used to describe attempts to keep fellow humans safe. Uh, another one, lefty lawyers, is quite popular at the moment. In fact, I think Robert Jenrick is a, is a keen exponent of that phrase. Lefty lawyers, the people actually charged with ensuring what laws we have to protect us from the engines of power and privilege are actually enacted, that we are, as humans, confident of having our rights, or human rights, upheld. The human rights of 72 people in North Kensington in June 2017 were categorically not upheld. They were horribly abused. And we've had 14 years of government, or at least eight years of government, dedicated to the denigration of human rights, or even, in some cases, the disappearance and the more you read into what happened, the more you read into the report, the more you realise that it is a direct consequence of culture and ideology that sees regulation or protection as the enemy. You, you can loosely describe it as a sort of Tufton Street-inspired mania, the idea that if you allow wealth to do whatever wealth wants, then the market will self-regulate. You don't need to impose rules on people because the market will essentially somehow organically create rules. Tony reminds me of another phrase. We should write these down, actually, shouldn't we? Elf and safety, lefty lawyers, bonfire of red tape. I found an article yesterday from before the tragedy uh, describing David Cameron as celebrating his successful bonfire of red tape. I mean, incredibly retrospectively unfortunate language, but goodness me, a bonfire of red. Well, what is red tape? Red tape is the kind of regulation that prevents companies from putting flammable cladding on the side of a building. Red tape is the kind of regulation that would see punishments in place for people who rented out properties or, or social housing organisations that presided over properties that were not fit for purpose, communal areas that were not safe. Red tape. And listen, today's not a day for criticising ordinary people who got caught up in the rhetoric, but how many times have you found yourself thinking that elf and safety, as Richard Littlejohn likes to call it, or, uh, or red tape, as Jacob Rees-Mogg likes to call it, or lefty lawyers, as Robert Jenrick likes to call them, how many times have you found yourself caught up in that rhetoric and, and thinking that somehow these are things that you should be opposed to? It remains by far the single most fascinating and important element of politics in general and British politics in particular over the last hundred years. The ease with which decent ordinary people are persuaded to act and ultimately vote against their own interests. What's next on the list? Oh, let's get rid of the European Convention of Human Rights. Let's be like Belarus and Russia and surrender even more of our hard-won rights and protections at the altar of power and privilege because of cap tug forelock letting the powerful letting the wealthy do whatever they want is somehow supposed to help the rest of us through a form of uh, if not trickle down economics then trickle down decency well i ain't seen much trickling down from this lot and I hope their collars are felt sooner rather than later, although everybody seems to be relatively philosophical about the necessity of due process. Lucy Easthope, uh, an emergency planner who's written a superb book called When the Dust Settles, and, and who spoke to me a little bit on, on the Full Disclosure podcast about 
Grenfell. She, she disagrees. She, she believes that the police inquiry could have unfolded e- either alongside the uh, Martin Morbick inquiry or um, independently of, and, and I, I don't know, she knows more about this stuff than I do, but the, uh, the, the, the fact is that the Metropolitan Police appear determined to pursue culprits, some of whose names are now known and are on the public record. So this is a strange question, but it's a really important one. I want to know how surprised you are to learn that incompetence, dishonesty and greed practiced by wealthy business people and right-wing politicians and council employees on good scratches, on, on, on good wax, but essentially being rewarded for diminishing the quality of service they provide to their clients. I want to know how surprised you are by what you've learned over the last 24 hours. And, and perhaps you haven't learned anything, in which case you won't be surprised. But I am shocked to my core, even though I knew most, if not all, of what was coming. But am I surprised? This is the country of Hillsborough, Margaret Thatcher's uh, chief press advisor Bernard Ingham went to his grave a couple of years ago still refusing to apologize for claiming that the Hillsborough tragedy had been caused by Liverpool football fans. Uh, The Sun newspaper carried a front page stating the truth even though the editor was told by the journalist that wrote the article that that was an unconscionable and unjustifiable headline. Again Rupert Murdoch who of course, um, it was very much in, in bed with Margaret Thatcher's government, did nothing to punish the um, despicable human being responsible for that front page. So my surprise is mitigated by my knowledge of what's gone before. We've had a crash course recently in what happens when right-wing, po- maybe right-wing's not fair, actually, but when politicians and powerful business interests combine to ride roughshod over the rights and interests of ordinary people. We've had a crash course with the post office scandal. The detail of that, and remember, a lot of people think there was a racist element to that scandal as well, just as many of us believe there was a profoundly racist element to the Grenfell Tower tragedy. But the scale of the post office scandal, the attempts at cover-up, the knowledge of people at the top of the pyramid that what was happening was unconscionable and the failure were it not for a couple of journalists to bring it into the light, which brings us back to Dave in Shepherd's Bush yesterday. He said, what if they hadn't written it down? They'd all sound mad if they'd been running around after the fire saying, I told you this was going to happen, I warned you. But they wrote it down. It's all there in black and white. So I, I don't want to ask a depressing question necessarily in, in terms of will we learn from this or will we be sitting here in 10 years discussing another tragedy which gets filed under the headline, it must never be allowed to happen again, although I'm kind of interested in that. But what does this tragedy tell us about our country? What does this inquiry tell us about modern Britain? Or Britain, actually, it doesn't have to be modern at all. And that's why I want to know whether or not you're surprised, and if not, why not? And bring whatever you want to the party. It might be Windrush, it might be the infected blood scandal, it might be the post office scandal, it might be Hillsborough. But I think if you'd come to me 20 years ago and talk to me about the establishment conspiring with engines of power and influence to keep the British public in the dark, I'd have thought you were a little bit nuts. I think if you'd come to me 20 years ago to tell me that a tragedy like this displays a pattern of institutional behavior, that institutions are dedicated to self-promotion and self-protection, and and the rest of us are chaff, fodder, sometimes ammunition, I don't think I would have believed you. I had a little bit more faith in the notion of society than I have today, which is why I feel such a burning debt to Sir Martin Moore Bick, such a deep sense of gratitude to somebody stepping up. And do you know his brother was in the army as well, so they were obviously raised with a notion of public service, public duty that's profoundly lacking from um, uh, uh, many corners of, of our country today. So I think 20 years ago, if you'd said to me that all of these things essentially speak to the same fundamental truths about our country, the Bloody Sunday cover-up and the, and the whitewash inquiry that followed, 
the infected blood scandal, the Hillsborough tragedy, uh, the post office scandal. You can't see them. Even Orgreave, I think, gets included on this list. And there will be other stories as well. I don't think you can see them in isolation. I think you can see them as part of a pattern, a pattern of power and privilege conspiring with engines of influence. Because remember, you kind of rely upon corrupt journalism to get away with some of this stuff. Margaret Thatcher's press secretary claiming to his grave that Hillsborough was the fault of Liverpool fans. Uh, I, you, you can't, and, and, of course, uh, uh, editor at The Sun, disgraced former editor of The Sun, Kelvin McKenzie, lying in the most despicable terms about dead children on the front page of the best-selling newspaper in the country. It doesn't happen because of one section of society. The politicians can't get away with it unless they've got journalists doing their bidding, and the journalists can't get away with it unless they've got politicians on their side. And neither of them can get away with it unless, in some cases, they've got the police singing from the same hideous hymn sheet as happened at Hillsborough, which is why the fact that seven years feels like a very long time for Grenfell investigations to have been completed but but in fact given the depth and the scale the breadth of the information evidence needed i i, I think they've done a i think they've done us all proud i really do i think they've done the country proud and i think they've done the victims proud although it's not for me to say that categorically um that's my belief that's my opinion you're welcome to disabuse me of it but that's why i want to talk about surprise I want to take off the rose-tinted spectacles that would have seen me call you a little bit nuts 20 years ago if you'd told me that this is the country that we live in, a country where ordinary people can be killed avoidably by the dishonesty, greed and incompetence of powerful, privileged people, vested interests and wealth. 0345 6060 three is the number you need and remember that if you were to open the daily telegraph today i am 99 percent certain you'll be able to find an article claiming how, uh, it's absolutely awful that people aren't proud of british history anymore well here's some british history for you grenfell tower hillsborough bloody sunday infected blood post office uh, sub postmasters jailed for crimes they did not commit while people above them in the chain of command, above them on the ladder of society, knew the injustices were unfolding. And that's just five off the top of my head. COVID contracts. Power, privilege and wealth combined to treat the rest of us like scum, whose lives are dispensable. Doesn't sound so nuts anymore, does it? James O'Brien on LBC. 23 is the time. Two more thoughts before we, we turn to the phones, which I will do sooner rather than later, I promise. The, the, the first is, I think what I'm looking for today is your explanation of how the ecosystem in which Grenfell Tower could happen was created. So the different forces and tides that created the ecosystem in which it could happen, in which incompetence, greed and dishonesty on an epic and institutional scale and practiced largely by engines of wealth and privilege and power could kill 72 entirely innocent human beings and leave their families still reeling from the horror of it. What is it about our political and establishment ecosystem that creates the circumstances in which this could happen? That, that's the question I have for you. I, it's possibly ambitious, but I have absolute faith in your ability to provide a variety of answers to it. And the second is, apropos nothing in particular, except this sense of theme, this sense of pattern. Guess what happens at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning? Module 8. Preliminary hearings. Children and young people. The latest chapter of the UK COVID-19 inquiry will get underway. Power, privilege, politicians. Creating circumstances in which entirely innocent people's lives could be treated with contempt or as dispensable. I'd forgotten about that and I literally just checked the dates now and couldn't quite believe that that chapter kicks off tomorrow. Rob's in Newcross. Rob, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Hello. Uh, Thanks for having me on. You're very welcome. Uh, I'll try and keep it simple. I'm a secretary, treasurer, secretary of our local tenants association.
said, no, it was a TMO. It was a housing cooperative before that. And okay. I've been involved with this now for over 40 years. Um, we're involved now in what I can only really describe as a sort of miniature wet uh, Grenfell because it's a failure. What we're experiencing is a failure of the me- of, of, of our mechanism of choosing materials uh, based on the fact that our organisation is hide but is. Is, is a prisoner to service charges. Um, like so it's, a slight, it's a slight... I don't know if there's a slight echo on the line, Rob. So it's, it's a suboptimal... Oh, um, yeah. it, it's a it's sub, a suboptimal line. technology. Don't worry. I, I mean, we'll, 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 we'll stay with it for a little bit longer. So you're describing a prioritisation of profit. I think service charges is, oh, is, oh, is oh, a so scandal so of a different charges. order. But a prioritisation of profit over the most basic provisions of safety and quality. Well, I'm, I'm essentially talking about the fact that communities are split now between service, between leaseholders and tenants, as they were, as they are in every you know yes. state in the country. And what that means is that leaseholders have to watch when their work is when work is being done on their estates. They have to count the pennies. At the, at, the expe- at the expense of... But when did that... You've been there 40 years. When did that start to change? Because some, some people... The co- right to, with the right to buy. Right. I was, at a, I was at a conference when it was first announced and there were all the big institutions there, London Housing, Charity, yes. all the rest of them. And they all essentially predicted the same sort of chaos and profit-driven madness that we're seeing now. And this is back to Hayek, back to the economic theory that if you let them do whatever they want, the market will regulate itself. Yes, but it's also social engineering. Go on. Because you're, you're, you're targeting communities and you're putting the proposition to them that, you know, you can have a great future if you buy a house, but it means that you will be taking decisions that are contrary to the people who are not buying the houses. What, what a call, call, I think it was James in Sickup, possibly or someone else yesterday, described this it as, as loser housing. Yes. That is creating this idea, and that is why perhaps even subconsciously some of the people responsible for what happened in Grenfell were treating the people that lived there with contempt because of, because of the social engineering that casts them as second-class citizens or third-class it, citizens. It's, it's not really about that sort of stigmatization it's about the economic hard truths and pe- working people you know were, were, were persuaded that this would be a good idea and now they're driven 24 7 to pay their mortgages now they can't be expected to read pages and pages of reports on uh, what we've got is not a fireproofing material problem it's a waterproofing material problem. This is in your properties, and this will it's create mould. And, and, and mould, in my opinion, is, is, a, is a, t- a ticking is time bomb for the national health. Exactly, and we've seen that now everywhere since a regeneration programme five years ago to solve an existing problem. Has made it and worse. And that has made the problem worse. And that, I have, I'm going to stop you there. I'm glad we stayed with it. The phone line was just about bearable for me. I hope it was for everybody else. But th- that phrase there, a regeneration problem that has made the situation worse. In this case, talking about the ingress of water, not fire. But it will be causing fungus. It will be causing mould. Which is why the story of the Labour MP last week, who was letting out properties riddled with mould, was so, to me at least, so, so troubling, so upsetting, so scandalous. And that notion of right to buy being part of the problem here is, is the second or third time that point has been made. Also reported this week, of course, that the, com- that the current government was considering the abolition of right to buy, stopping it altogether, which makes it rather convenient, doesn't it, that the housing minister and deputy prime minister, Angela Rayner, is up next on this programme. But first, here's Thomas Watts with your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. 33 is the time. A, a quick message from Kevin in Dublin. Listening to you talk about the list of recent scandals which have shown the disdain for British citizens that the British establishment uh, can have makes me think that people in the UK may finally be seeing the establishment in the same way that people outside the UK see it. Kevin, I should add, is in Dublin. 
um, perfidious Albion exists. The difference these days is that the empire is no more, so all of the scandal, tragedy and injustice is directed inwardly onto your own people rather than inflicted on far-flung parts of the world where it can be ignored or swept under the carpet. Um, Deputy Prime Minister and Secretary of State for Housing, Communities and Local Government, Angela Rayner, joins me now. Um, Angela, 58 recommendations by Sir Martin Morbick. Um, can you tell us which ones you already know you will definitely be implementing? Well, as you say, there was 58 recommendations yesterday and just reading that report, James, it was absolutely horrifying to see that at every level, whether it was the regulators, the government, previous governments, the local authority, the manufacturers of the cladding, just every single element failed those people and led to the avoidable deaths of 72 people and you know that if that isn't a moment to take stock and think how disgraceful it is that we got to that position and as Sir Martin laid out that actually profit and greed came above people's safety then you know that is my number one focus when looking at these 58 recommendations is to make further progress and since I've been in the job I've been appalled at how little progress has been made on the remediation we've got 4,630 high-rise buildings that we're aware of that need remediation 50% of them are in the process of it 29% concluded but that means that we've still got many many more that people are living in those blocks at the moment and will rightly be feeling very anxious about that and that's why my number one focus is really to 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 do that accelerate that work what would that acceleration and, look like because some of these people living in these properties have been phoning m m myself and my colleague sheila fogarty for years about their plight and their sense of abandonment I, i've been you're agreeing i think with their analysis absolutely. of abandonment so what will improvement look like to them directly and immediately yeah, I mean, there has been changes to the law. There has been prosecutions and over 400 legal notices that have been and processes have been set up to try and speed up this process, but it's far too slow. So one of the things I'm looking at now is how we can identify who are the owners of the building. Some of these are offshore shell accounts and, you know, subsidiaries and really trying to get to the bottom of that and speed up. And if there's legislation that needs to be tightened up, you know, there is overlap on some of the regulators we've got the new regulator that has got full powers from april this year but really assessing where this is up to and by this autumn to come forward with the accelerated plan because i just think it's completely unacceptable well, seven years on that we're in this situation but there's a line on page 225 and i can't imagine many people have read all 1700 pages yet but but it, it rather jumps out a task that only the government can undertake i i, I mean this is where the yeah. buck stops isn't it it absolutely is and you know the prime minister yesterday when he made the statement to the house you know one of the frustrations and i think this has been sort of picked up in some of the conversations you've been having time and time again we've had prime ministers stand up whether it's horizon the infected blood whether it's hillsborough and now we grenfell where absolute systemic failures and people apologizing for it and then saying things must change and then feeling like well when's the next thing coming we've got to have a look at ourselves as a country and the, the checks and balances that are in place to make sure that people are empowered and the one thing that stood out to me with what sir martin said was the way in which those tenants were treated they were raising concerns even before the Grenfell disaster and completely ignored they were uh, you know disempowered and I've seen this with tenants this is what we've spoke about where people are fearful to raise concerns because they'll be evicted from their homes just the the level of imbalance in the system at the moment where people are not able to raise their concerns and have them listened to and it wasn't just one area you know it wasn't just the government it was the regulators that were meant to keep people safe it was the manufacturers of the product who were dishonest as Sir Martin says it, it it's just beggars belief that throughout the whole system 
people's voices were not heard and they were treated like second class citizens. I mean, this is Kensington. This is one of the richest boroughs of our Indeed, it country. Was giving a, it was giving a £100 rebate to some, some residents not long before the tragedy happened, which we, we talked about at the time. But speaking about political will, Angela Rayner, why did so many of your parliamentary colleagues leave the chamber yesterday before the Prime Minister's statement on, on the inquiry? Well, I don't know about you know what was happening with other members of parliament and what their commitments were but you know i was i was there in the chamber and we told parliamentarians before yesterday that obviously you've seen the report it's quite weighty parliamentarians want to go off and read that report and we're going to put parliamentary time forward to have a proper debate so that people can digest what's in the report it's very hard to be fair to members of parliament who over half of them are new members of parliament to get a report of that okay. volume and I, i'm sure they wanted to go and read the report because that report came out and then the statement comes out and without having the context and being able to have read any elements of it it's really difficult for parliamentarians to raise issues if they've not not even seen the report okay well jo jo them. john mcdonald knows his way around parliament of course he's he's described the tragedy as social murder is, is that a phrase you have sympathy with well i mean anyone who reads the report will be absolutely horrified by what happened and it's really laid bare and Sir Martin says that all of those deaths were completely avoidable and and this is the point really that has been made about justice because you know the families and those that lost loved ones have said that you know the delay justice delayed is justice denied and that's why it's important that the Met Police are given all of the resources they need to carry out their and, investigation. And, and as you know some, some, some families worried about the speed with which the wheels of justice will turn. If if you're back here in two years' time, how likely do you think it is that anybody will have been jailed for their role in the Grenfell Tower tragedy? Well, I think from the statements that the Met Police have made, they, they understand the urgency, but also the... Uh, so you think it's absolute, more likely than not that jail time I, will be involved? I, I think... It, it, the Met Police have to look at that and they have to look at, I mean, it's pretty stark what is in that inquiry report. I, it's very, I have to be very careful, of James, course. about what I say, because, you know, as the Prime Minister set out yesterday, uh, anything that could impact on that investigation, you know, that would be the real scandal if if that prevents justice. The Met Police will carry out their investigation. They they know how important it is. They have been investigating over this period. They have been gathering evidence and they will continue in light of the substantial information in the uh, report by Sir Martin yesterday. And, and as, as a consequence of that report, under more scrutiny, of course, than, than, than ever before. We, we, just to return briefly to the detail, and some of the language that you've used. What what jumped out most at you? We're, we're trying to map the difference on the programme this morning between surprise and shock. What genuinely shocked you the most about what you've read so far? I was angry because... It wasn't just it wasn't just one part of the system. It was every single bit of the system. That's what if you, shocked me, and that's what made me really angry, was because it wasn't just one bit. There was systematic failures and disregard and there, there were so many opportunities where something could have been done differently and it wasn't and in fact reading the report you can see how it was made worse you know you, you look at the timeline from you know they describe about government from the early 1990s around understanding the flammable cladding and then up into the 2000s and then even in 2016 uh, the department that I and now over oversee knowing full well the gravity and not the the deregulation and lack of um action that to me is just you know it's not a okay. reading that report it's not just like oh I didn't know it, or it wasn't my responsibility it, it was a systematic disregard for responsibility well, and, and yet of course oh i didn't know or it wasn't my responsibility is precisely the defense that your colleague jazz athwell has offered up for exposing his tenants to uh, arguably very exploitative and inarguably very unpleasant circumstances in in the shadow of sir martin morbick's report how can jazz athwell in Il ilford south still have the whip in your labor party 
Well, I mean, the the whipping situation is not something that I have, you know, it's not something that I have control over. You can have but an opinion. Will, but I, my, my opinion is, and I've been very clear on this, is that landlords have an absolute obligation, and I don't care who that landlord is, whether it's a Labour MP or anybody else, I've been very clear, and I've been touched by speaking to Arab's family about what happened to Arab, and around Arab's law, I've been very clear about how tenants at the moment are at risk and fear, raising concerns around the Section 21 no fault evictions. This is why I'm absolutely determined to put more power in for tenants. And it doesn't matter who that landlord is. You have an obligation. I've talked about this before, James. Homes are homes. They're not assets. When you're a landlord, you have an obligation. So that's that's somebody's home. So can and we, people can, need so to feel I, safe I, I, in their I, I, home. As, as someone, regardless of your job, as someone who cares passionately about tenants' rights, do you, do you think that Jazz Athwell should be facing further censure from his employers, i.e. the Labour Party? Well, I think Jazz has already said that he's appalled by those conditions that he's seen in his properties, and I'm sure he's. <laughs> we've just we've literally it. just I been condemning be. the culture of "I didn't Absolutely. know about it; it wasn't my fault," and yet here but, we are. But he needs to, he needs to make sure, as a landlord, that his properties are fit for purpose and that people are so looked he gets after. A, so he them. gets a chance to. to redeem the situation as it were well I, let's I, move I, I on think... from that I, I, it's, you're, it's clear that, that, that that's what's happening the telegraph reported yesterday that you are considering the abolition of of the right to buy scheme in its current form before you tell me whether that's true or not a, a couple of my callers my most informed callers believe that right to buy has contributed to a form of social hierarchy creation in 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 rented accommodation um that that perhaps helps understand how residents of grenfell tower could be treated as second or third class citizens what one um expert who's worked in the sector for 40 years used the phrase loser housing a perception that loser housing has come into play since people were offered the opportunity to buy their council houses are, are you thinking of as the telegraph says ripping up margaret thatcher's right to buy policy well, first of all, I think there's always been a level of stigma around council and social housing, whereas actually, you know, I talked about being from a council estate when I grew up, but actually now it's luxury to have social housing because there is so little of it. And the biggest problem that we've got, which has created this hierarchy and where people fear that they can't raise concerns is because we don't have enough supply, which is why I've talked about we've got to fix supply. But in terms of the right to buy... I've said clearly that I think that people, you know, if you've lived in a house for decades or you, you, you've that's your home, you've been renting it, that you should have an opportunity to buy it. But it shouldn't be the 2012 changes that the government made, which meant that people could buy the homes after a very short period of time on a very high discount. It meant that the taxpayers were not getting the value for money that they put into those homes and we wasn't able to replace the social stock that we need. So we have to make sure the system is fair. And that's what we're consulting on at the moment is not taking away people's right to buy because I don't think that's the right decision to make. But also that we're making sure that we've got the housing stock, the social housing, that actually is quite critical at the moment because far too many people who should be in social housing are at the mercy of private landlords because we haven't got the social housing we need in this country. F finally, Angela Rayna, if I could catch you off guard, um, which is obviously increasingly difficult to do, but perhaps in, I don't know, an Ibethan nightclub, if I could catch you off guard, I'm pretty confident you'd be a, a caustic critic of the decision to take away winter fuel payments from millions of British pensioners, wouldn't you? Uh, I, I'm completely angry by when we came into government and within a week of getting into government realising the significant black hole that the previous government knew about. You know, the IFS was talking about the real difficult context. We all knew it was a difficult context. So, so why the pick economy. on them? Why, why, why start with pensioners? Well, it's, it's not a question of picking on them. Well, it, it is, They're, if you, I it, think they feel like it is, certainly. Well, it isn't, and I'll explain why. Because the winter fuel payment was a universal payment, regardless of what 
wealth or what income pensioners have got we've means tested it because we we've had to we felt that was the right decision and there is 800,000 approximately pensioners currently that are entitled to pension credit that don't receive it so first of all I'd say to any listeners that think they're going to be really impacted on this uh, that that first should check whether they're entitled to uh, pension credit those that are just above that and I completely appreciate that there's people that will not be eligible for it the household support fund which the Chancellor has expanded means that there will be additional support for people that need it as well and the triple lock on pensions but just to say as well James is that the previous government we saw inflation go up to nearly 11% that directly impacts on pensioners because of their income is fixed so when inflation goes up that hits them really hard in their pockets of course the um the problems with the cost of energy prices as well if you look at the money that the pensioners were given with from the previous government 12 18 months ago but you look at how much they're having to pay out as a result of that they were worse off because of the government mishandled the finances and that's why it's important how long do you think that's going to hold for I, I, I mean i know that the, the previous governments were still referring back to 2010 when um they were asked about their own fiscal policies how long do you think you and your colleagues can blame difficult decisions on what you inherited and and when might we reasonably expect you to have improved the situation enough to stop having to hurt people like pensioners well it's it's not a question of just blaming them like for example there's decisions oh, okay we're making... well whatever whatever verb you prefer sure. when's the deadline for, but for there's it stopping? decisions we're making for example one of the first key decisions i made within a week and the chancellor was announcing around the planning policy framework so that we can get the infrastructure we need so we can grow our economy we've been very clear on some of the decisions that we're making immediately so that we can grow the economy and pay for our public services we you know the gov- the previous government have criticized us in terms of the uh, recommendations from the independent pay bodies it was right we did that we had strikes crippling the the uk before because of what the government was doing and their tone and what they've done previously we've taken a different tract which is about how we grow the economy how we get our public services working and how we can then start fixing these issues whether it's the two child cap which people were very angry about because we were very upfront about that that we couldn't afford to do that immediately but there is things that we're doing now which will make an absolute impact for the long-term future of our country not sticky plaster gimmicks of here's a little thing over here but actually fixing the fundamentals so that the economy will grow and we can pay for our public services. Angela Rayner, Deputy Prime Minister, Secretary of State for Housing, Communities and Local Government. Thank you for your time and and, and thank you because it was rather more time, I think, than was originally agreed. It's 10 to 11. James O'Brien on LBC. Uh, 10.54 is the time. John says, you can tell it's a new government. Someone from it has actually gone on James's show. Um, And uh, uh, the, the appearance of the Deputy Prime Minister hopefully does mark a... Uh, a, a, an opening of communications with with government that was sadly absent during the last administration and why would any politician not want to go on the most listened to show the most listened to talk show on commercial radio in the whole of the united kingdom not just on this radio station I, so it beats me but if you bump into any of the people that still um uh, avoid us like the play perhaps you could ask them now i mentioned yesterday's show i mentioned dave calling from Shepherd's Bush as being very memorable, more memorable, of course, for all of us, was a a call that I reminded you of that I took in the days after the tragedy from from Shah, who lost his mum and his aunt in the tragedy. And and Shah has rung in today, Shah Aglani from Kensington. How are you, mate? Hi, um, I'm I'm good, thank you. Good. Good to talk to you. Always. And... Where are you? Not 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 geographically, but but emotionally um, and perhaps even intellectually on what, um, what we discovered yesterday. Lost and bewildered oh, by um, how the uh, system um, kind of I wouldn't say works or doesn't work. Mm. Um, I think we have a system in place that is designed to fail in these sort of uh, occasions, uh, designed to let the perpetrators you know walk free. Um, I think we have uh, a system that is that requires an updating and laws that requires looking at. So this sort of things won't happen. But uh, so long as uh, we have the the you know uh, politicians, uh, which 
don't want to address the real issues, which is uh, the uh, safety laws on, on safety laws and the lobbying uh, question that influences the decision makings of um, our um, you know peers. I'm afraid things like this would happen again, as we saw in 26th of August in East London. Um, you, you, no, were, no. you were waiting. I think you were on hold while I was talking to Angela Rayner. Did, did anything she say, uh, anything she um, said encourage you? She addressed fairly directly some of the points you yes. raised. Sure. Yes. Uh, I, I mean, uh, credit to her. We've, we've already um, spoken with her uh, about, you know, the need for change. And she has promised more time so we can discuss it further but um it requires the 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 whole thing requires deep and um you know precision work by by um the prime minister who mm. has um, background in you know in in, in prosecution and, does, and yeah. in law um and and see what he can do to actually bring the laws up to date. So we're we're, we're back uh, to that line on page two hundred and twenty-five, a task that only the government can undertake. And and you're describing the 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 repairing, if you like, of the ecosystem in which the tragedy could happen. The only way you can ensure it won't happen again is by changing the environment in which we all live and the the ecosystem in which uh, uh, Grand, Grand, Grandfell Tower could be put in the p- perilous position that it was put in by incompetence, greed, and um, uh, 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 dishonesty. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and so long as uh, there is, you know, if, if uh, there is no um, kind of punitive action on um, people who actually allow these to happen on their watch, I'm afraid things won't change. I, I'm going to ask uh, you two, two questions that I asked the Deputy Prime Minister. The, the first is, what shocked you most yeah, I, mean, I don't know how much you actually learned yesterday, Shah. People that have been following the inquiry very, very closely probably didn't learn much at all. But did anything make your uh, eyebrows raise? Uh, um, the um, the task uh, that uh, Sir Martin Morbeck took uh, took on was a mammoth one, mm. truly. And um, you know, he basically put into words what we kind of were observing, and we knew. So we have it now in you know in front of us, but the 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 thing is that you know seven years on uh, the uh, you know with all this information now on, um, um, you know I just, yeah. I just don't know that we whether if we see any sort of manslaughter charges. Well, that brings me to the second question I was going to ask you, and, and in a way you've half answered it, which is whether you think two three years from now we will have witnessed people being sent to jail for what happened to your mother I, and your aunt that night? I, I, I don't think so. Uh, I doubt it much because uh, the, 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 the bars on, on, on actually may, securing a conviction uh, for those people are set so high uh, by the system, um, you know, that um, it's... Um, I think if we had a prosecution from... Um, before inquiry, maybe we would have had a chance. But now, um, you know, I doubt it. I played our last, well, our first ever conversation out to my listeners yesterday. And at the end of it, I, I, I tried to reassure you that there wouldn't be a cover up. I want to try again to reassure you that there will be criminal charges. Um, uh, thank you, James, for your help. And, and, and think in all these years, I've, I've listened to your, um, you know, uh, continuous. Um, you know, highlighting of the issue, and you've been one of the uh, you know most influential and prominent. There hasn't uh, been a cover up, has there? I think we can say that there, uh, there hasn't been a cover up. Um, no, we thanks to no, Sir the, Martin. We, <laughs> the, the, we we have the all, 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 well most of the thing uh, information now. I think the cover up is probably uh, lies with actually how the previous government manage the whole thing to kind of uh, okay. uh, bring lesser charges so we'll I have to we'll we, have to wait and see but i'm gonna i'm gonna yeah. I, I can't make you a promise on this occasion i was a i was a bit emotional last time and a bit unprofessional probably as a consequence but <laughs> no, i thank you i can tell you what i believe i i i think we will see proper charges brought i i hope so i 
I, I, I hope for all our sake, I hope so the I. charges are serious charges. Are, and thank you, James, for all your support well, all these years. On. I'd say, yeah, well, it's a, no, anyone no. would do in, in my position. No. Shah, thank no, you. Thank no, you. No, it means a lot to me. You know it does. Thank you. Uh, you take care, please. Um, Shah Aglani there, whose uh, mother and aunt perished in the Grenfell Tower tragedy in circumstances that I still can't even recall without tearing up a bit and you will know why if you if you listen to the call that Shah made to me in a in a in a much more emotional state in the days immediately after the tragedy um uh, the, the, the consequences of which continue to reverberate around the country but the consequences for the culprits now move into precisely the space that Shah described a, a, a space of uncertainty and either pessimism or optimism that justice will be seen to be done James O'Brien on LBC. Five minutes after 11. This is interesting. I think this unintentionally, uh, which isn't a criticism of Nick, because it's just not what he actually texted in to prove. But to my eye, this really demonstrates the what can happen when you prioritise profit over everything else and you expect the market to regulate itself. And he cites one really grim example of something that I hope Angela Rayner has very near the top of her to-do list. Hi, James. I'm a fire protection specialist, and the Grenfell disaster highlighted failings specific to Grenfell, but there are deficiencies in fire safety across a broader spectrum of scenarios. The lack of mandatory sprinklers in residential buildings and the routine installation of obsolete types of fire protection systems used to safeguard against commercial kitchen fires, for example, in hospitals, hotels, and care homes, are just a couple of examples. So, What Nick describes is expenditure by companies dedicated to producing profit, whether they are property companies or whether they are um, uh, the the people that operate the commercial kitchens or the the hoteliers or the care homes. And and that's why it needs to be law. That's why that line on, on page 225, which Peter Apps picked up on in an article for The Guardian today, Peter Apps written what is probably the seminal text about the Grenfell Tower tragedy, that line about this is a task that only government can achieve. You, you need to make it compulsory to do what is right. And it's the opposite of the ideology that has been in play for the last 14 years. It's the polar opposite of a kind of laissez-faire economics or a belief that the government needs to be smaller. How small does the government need to be? (laughs) Is, Is the question you should be asking these people because it is law, it is legislation and enactment of legislation and upholding of law that ensures people are safer in their homes. And there are just, I mean, for people in homes, there's one example there, the lack of mandatory sprinklers in residential buildings. So people like Nick cost money, and the things that he recommends cost money. And the only way you can ensure that the things that he recommends are implemented is if it's illegal not to do so. So that's why you need lefty lawyers. That's why you need red tape. That's why you need elf and safety. That's why you need all the things that the right-wing media has spent the best part of three decades trying to persuade you are your enemy. Maybe just a few of the ears currently listening to this will prick up and recognize that I've just described you. I'm going to describe me now. Whenever I turn my attention or try to turn your attention to matters educational, I I think it's important to recognize two things. Number one is that my own experiences of education are on a very personal level, 40-odd years old, 30 or 40 years old. I've had some experience through educating my children in both the state and the private, and then the state again (laughs) sector, new term starting, of course, this week. But I don't have any way of experiencing absence of privilege, and that's the second bit that I always bring to the table when we're discussing matters of education. Never more so than today, because school exclusions have risen by a fifth in England alone for in the past year. And I think that what I would have done once was describe being expelled from school as one of the best things that has ever happened to me. And then I read that children from low-income backgrounds, children with special educational needs and children with mental health issues are those most likely to miss learning. Um, And also, of course, we, we end up spending more money on educating pupils outside the mainstream where, to quote the latest report, quality and safety is less guaranteed. So suspensions have gone up by more than a fifth. 
This is research from the Institute for Public Policy Research. Castrap Council's spending increasing amounts on educating pupils outside the mainstream. Um, and, and what I recognised reading that was that, yes, being expelled from school was in a way one of the best things that ever happened to me because of my class and my privilege. So because I had incredibly committed parents about whom I felt enormous guilt at being expelled, I ended up working harder for the last three months of my A-levels than I'd ever worked before in my life. I ended up prioritising my own educational advancement, abandoning the somewhat fanciful idea of going to drama school and being determined to fulfil my parents' expectations of me going to a good university. Being chucked out of school gave me exactly the kind of head wobble that I was in desperate need of at that time in my life. But if I had been from a low-income background with perhaps parents who were not fully engaged in my education or indeed uh, across the information they needed to be across to advance my educational interests, if I had special educational needs or mental health issues and I got expelled from school, I think I would have slipped through the cracks. I really do. I did a tiny bit of mentoring at a school in South London a hundred years ago and I remember two things about it. I remember the discovery for me that teachers had to deal with children whose parents had absolutely no interest whatsoever in not even what they studied at school but in whether they even turned up to school or not and teachers having i just didn't know that existed it's odd in a way because there were plenty of kids at my public school whose parents didn't really care what they did at school. That's why they paid tens of thousands of pounds every year to pass the responsibility on to others. We didn't even get to go home in the evenings. We had to sleep there. So there plenty, I mean, it was the aristocracy who invented the idea that children should be seen and not heard. So I, I, I don't want to in any way suggest that poorer people are by definition more neglectful parents some, some of the most neglectful parents i've ever come across in my life are, are some of the wealthiest people i've ever met i farm it all out if not to nanny then to school if not to school then to servants i mean it, it, the list is almost endless but of course that, that that those servants nanny public school that's a safety net that catches a child whose parents can't carry them or whose parents have dropped them if you don't have that safety net, then I presume that being expelled from school is the single most awful thing that could happen to you. It takes away the only adults in your life who are demonstrating any interest in whether or not you even turn up every day and what you do when you get there. And then something else happened to me. The, oh, the other bit that I remember from school, and I may have mentioned this to you before. So you're talking about 15-year-old boys who are, you know, six foot tall and, and in some cases physically imposing. You know, I always remember if you played rugby against lads that were a couple of years older than you when you were 13, it could be a terrifying experience. So I, and I watched a female teacher who was five foot nothing in a, in a stocking feet uh, uh, deal with a boy who just stood up in the middle of class and walked to the front of the classroom and didn't do anything else. He didn't speak. He didn't threaten. He didn't shout. He didn't. He just stood there. I've, I've, I don't know why that haunts me. Haunts is not quite the right word. He just stood there. I don't, it was a sort of um, an articulation in, in a way of a form of power. What can she do to make him sit down again? That's the kind of kid that ends up getting excluded and ends up getting suspended and ends up getting expelled. And then the second thing is something that happened this week, oddly, when I was on a bus. I was on the top deck of a bus. And three kids got on one of whom you can sometimes tell can't you I, I i don't know whether um there's a sort of almost a manic nature but one of whom you could tell was 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 going to behave badly the, the sort of way that he, they, they swung their way down the top deck of the bus and he starts spitting he starts spitting out of the window originally at his quotes mates and quotes who, who were down there and subsequently at anybody else whenever the bus stopped, at anybody else who was waiting at the bus stop. And uh, to be fair, his two friends were discouraging him or seeking to make him stop, but also finding it quite amusing. And then an older fellow on the bus told him to stop. So I was, I was a few rows in front, not entirely sure what was going on and a little bit reluctant to sort of turn around and make it clear that I was checking it out. 
Um, but the reason why I know he was spitting was because an older fella said, if you don't stop that spitting, I will, tur I will turf you off this bus. And, and, and the kid pointed out that he wouldn't be able to do that. <laughs> and that's when I thought, oh, Lord, I can't let this unfold. Can I? If, if this uh, older gentleman puts himself in potential legal trouble by physically trying to manhandle the, uh, the youth off the bus, then I, I'm going to have to help him. Uh, and, you know, like most people, I don't, I, I don't really want to get involved. So I'm, I'm, I'm listening. I'm earwigging the standoff. I'm hoping someone else on the bus, if it does reach a point where someone has to do something, I'm hoping someone else on the bus does something. And happily, the bus driver then comes up the stairs and tells this kid that he's got it all on camera and the police are coming and he can either get off the bus now or wait and talk to the police. And the kid denies that he'd done anything, at, at which point uh, I can say happily, no, it was that one there, it wasn't those two. He, he's the one that's been spitting. Um, and it's just that little moment where you wondered whether he was going to call the bus driver's bluff. I don't know whether the police had been called or not. I'm talking about 14, 13, 14. And what happens next? Now, I think that's why children get suspended and expelled. And I could sit here and be all bleeding heart liberal and, and hand-wringing lovey about it, but I don't. I wouldn't know what to do in that circumstance. In a sense, he was expelled from the bus, right? In a sense, he was suspended from the bus. It was, he was removed. His behavior got him removed from the environment he wanted to be in and was supposed to be in. And at the moment, in that moment, I thought, good, that's the right thing to do. And I know a bus isn't a school, and I know a bus driver isn't a teacher. But I was relieved to be relieved of responsibility for his behavior, or at least responsibility for what might have happened to the older gentleman who was in a bit of a pickle wasn't he really because if he if the minute he laid a hand on this lad all bets are off so i i, I would not i was not going to let him let lay a hand on but from the point of view of helping him like yeah it's not worth it mate or whatever happily that didn't happen because the bus driver was so on the ball but then of course his that could have compromised his safety so what can you do with it with a child like that in a classroom what can you do with a persistently disruptive child? Because expelling them or, or suspending them, if they're posh-ish, wealthy, privileged, might be just the wake-up call they need. But if they're not, that might be the beginning of the end of the chance of them becoming valuable, valued, valued contributors to society. What do you reckon? Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three is the number you need. So come at this from whatever angle you want. If you're a teacher, what would you do with the boy at the front of the class? If you're a bus passenger, what would you do with the boy spitting out of the window? If you are a, a, a parent, an observer of, of, of teenage behaviour, what would you do with the child who's disrupting everybody else's education? What's the best way in which to conduct these kind of conundrums. Because I can't believe that chucking them out of school is the best way forward unless you impose a sort of utilitarian equation and calculate what's best for everybody involved and sacrifice the future of these young people upon the altars of everybody else's prospects. Maybe that's the only way forward and we've just got to suck it up. I hope not, but I don't know. What can you tell me? 0345 6060 nine seven three is the number you need any of those angles on that any, any anything you please because they seem to me and i could have got this wrong wouldn't be the first time they seem to me to all speak to the same subject matter which is adults ability to quotes control end quotes a young person who refuses to do what they're told or refuses to behave and, and I, i'm as baffled by it now as i was when i watched that 15-year-old boy get up in the middle of class for no reason whatsoever and just stand at the front of the classroom to the um, frustration, shall we say, of the, of the teacher who was physically incapable. And remember, I got this is why I mentioned my own school days because I would have been grabbed by the ear or by that little bit tuft of hair that grows just out of your side, top of your sideburn. I, I would have been physically, physically 
what's the word I'm even looking for? Corralled back into, you couldn't do that at my school when I was young because you'd get beaten up effectively by adults. None of us want to go back to that. So what happens instead? It's 11.19. James O'Brien on LBC. Uh, 21 minutes after 11 is the time. Karen says, you've got to love some bus drivers. Uh, my best friend was saying goodbye to her daughter at the bus stop. They'd had an argument and the daughter was sulking. My best friend asked her for a kiss goodbye when the bus drew up. The daughter refused and stropped. That's a great verb, Karen. Well done. I think you might have just invented it. Stropped onto the bus. The bus driver called up the bus to the daughter. I'm not moving till you give your mum a kiss. <laughs> and she did, laughing. That's lovely. Um, I, I did conclude the story. I've got one complaint. The, the, the lad got off the bus. I, maybe I didn't make that clear, actually. So the lad concerned got off the bus and the situation. They all got off the bus in fact the situation resolved itself but it didn't have to um it, it's a it's a tipping point if you like in an individual scenario that i described but also in the education system i think uh, and i've got a, i've got my some it's mystery hour at 12 i've got a guest coming in at 11 45 and you mustn't let me forget i've got an unhinged headline and i think we're going to bury Smear Keir, because he's Prime Minister now. But we've got an unhinged headline that allows us to bury Smear Keir and open up a competition. So the producer's idea this. I said, you must come up with some ideas for new features on the programme. And the producer said, why don't we have a competition for the listeners to come up with ideas for new features on the programme? And I thought, that's not quite what I'm... That's, that's not what I... <laughs> mm. So that may happen as well. But first, Alison's in Barnet. Alison, what made you pick up the phone? Oh, well, you described perfectly a scenario that I had with my own son, who oh. by the time was 13 or 14, was a six-foot-tall lad yeah. who played rugby for his school. And, I mean, up until he was about 12 or 13, um, he'd been doing very well at school. I'd never had any behavioural problems with him. But, unfortunately, his father passed away when he was 11. Oh, and this had a, yeah, that had a very profound effect on him. Now, I was lucky in the fact that he went to a really good grammar school in North London, and they really worked with me to keep my son engaged. And he scraped through his GCSEs, but he got to the point where he was about to go into sixth form, and he just said, I'm not going. I'm not going. Right. And I thought, oh, my God, what am I going to do? Yeah. So as a compromise, I got him into the local college where he was going to study for a BTEC, which is what he wanted. He said, oh, you know, the school can't support me. It's not what I want to do, what they offer. I said, absolutely fine. All started off well. He was 16, going on 17 by this age, and I would leave him, not to his own devices, but get the bus to college. I had two smaller children. I had to get them to school and then right. get myself to work. It wasn't very long before college started ringing me and saying he wasn't turning up. Uh. So on occasion, I would leave work in a hurry, drive home, get him out of bed, take him to college, etc. And then one morning, I, I did this uh, routine where I left work, comp, came home, went into his bedroom. I said, come on now, time to, please don't do this to me. You've got to go to college. I'll wait downstairs for you. Well, 20 minutes passed, nothing. Then he strolled down in his underpants to the kitchen and I said, what are you doing? You know, you've got to go. I've got to go back to work. And he just looked at me and said, well, what are you going to do? And I thought, that's right. What am I going to do? And I, I went over to him and I sort of poked him in the back and I said, I'm going to take you. And with that, he turned around and sort of faced up to me, right. loomed over me. Oh dear. And I said, I'm going to call the police. And he said, Oh, please, don't embarrass yourself. And I said, no, I'm going to. And he said, well, what are they going to do? Well, anyway, I did call the police. And they came to the house. And I have to say, it was awful because they kind of took his side. I got a barrage of misogyny and my son standing there rolling his eyes, sort of cocking a wink at the policeman as if to say, you see but he wasn't woman. brave. I mean, I, 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 it's a, certainly a very long story. I hope we're quite near the end of it. I don't, I don't, it want, to add, I don't want to add to your burden. But he is. hadn't broken any laws, had he? Well, I mean, he was he kind of threatening and aggressive. And I think right. as a single mum with a six-foot son, yes. I was like, oh, my God, what are my options? What can I do? So how, what, I, what did happen? What, how, how, did, how did the situation resolve itself? Well, they said, well, come on, Sonny Jim, you know, put your trousers on. Let your mum take you. Stop being a naughty boy. And um, 
and he went. But I have to say, I mean, that, you know, I don't know whether that was the right or wrong thing to do, but I was sort of at the end of my tether. Yeah. And, I totally I, and of course, you're, you're describing the polar opposite of what we're talking about, which is a, a child who doesn't have any parental support at home or who doesn't have any concern for, um, for, for, for their child's welfare. It sounds horrible, Alison. It really does. Um, 26 minutes after 11 is the time in Scotland, and this is increasingly the case. Uh, the story appears to be rather, rather different. Cases of exclusion have fallen from a high of 44,794 down to 11,676. So there are wobbles and that there, there are spikes, there are ups and downs, but that is the overall picture, which suggests they're doing something rather different in Scotland from what they are doing here. But what, what happens when you exclude a child from school? I presume it makes everything worse. And that is, um, perhaps I needed to be a little clearer, that is the question that I'm essentially asking. What happens when you exclude a child from school? Or what can you do with someone else's child, whether you're on a bus or whether you're a teacher or whether you're in a position of authority, who, who simply refuses to behave, for want of a slightly less Victorian-sounding word. Dwayne is in Southampton. Dwayne, what would you like to say? Yeah, hi, James. How you doing? I'm good, mate. What's on your mind? Yeah, so just in answer to your question, um, as someone who's obviously gone through the education system myself, I'm 19 now, so okay. haven't left it too long ago. <laughs> um, yeah, More I, I recently than that, me. More recently than me, Dwayne. <laughs> yeah, certainly. Yeah, so I, I was just thinking myself, the, the best way to, to approach this situation would be to do it amicably and uh, diplomatically. So essentially just a fi finding what the root cause is of why the child is behaving like that and then trying to approach it from a, a, an area of uh, understanding what, why they're doing that and how you can solve it that way. Because I think like sort of condemning them is the best approach because it just leads them to, to resent the system that is that basically well, booting Chris, them Chris out. Well, Chris has written, if you cut the cord completely... They're likely yeah. to be taken in by gangs, um, uh, yeah. and, and they could be lost for a long time. Unfortunately, he spoils it r rather by going on to recommend national service. But but are you speaking <laughs> from from experience, or are you speaking from a sort of overview? Because I, I suspect teachers would try that, but the the, mm. the it's the it's the sanction of last resort that becomes problematic. I think, isn't it? That what do you do if all that fails? Yeah, it, yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, th th there's always a way to, to to solve it sort of diplomatically. Uh, but coming from experience as someone who's not, not the best behaved um, mm. during my part of school and, and the way that I was dealt with, I think that if the teachers came from like more of an area of understanding rather than you know, just the straight detentions and, and things like that, then it would have been how a, quickly a do you get a, How quickly do you get a re reputation, I wonder? How quickly do you, do you become a kid that teachers think it's not worth engaging with? Because that, that, the, the, the examples that I've provided, you know, the, um, the, the, all, all has failed. There is someone trying to cause trouble. And in a school yeah. environment, you can do what you describe. On the top deck of a, of a 267, I'm not sure you can, but what, mm. that, that's, that's getting inside that mindset. But I like your optimism, the idea that everybody is reachable. I actually agree with you. But teachers may not have the time or, or the resources or, 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 or even sometimes the skills. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I guess that, that that could be an area of training that, that the teachers could go through. And you also need to, to work with the, the parents as well um, of the kids uh, to, to sort of find find out more. And maybe it's like a case of doing meetings. Uh, that That's something that, that helped me was, was having a meeting with, with my parents and, and their teachers and figure, figuring out why. But again, and that means that, your parents want you to be. I, I, I sort of thinking that sometimes the expulsions are likely to be um, happening more to the children whose parents are not engaging or whose parents are not as concerned as yours obviously are. When you're uh, older than you are now, you realise how lucky you are to have parents who um, uh, care in these kind of contexts, even though when you're at school it can sometimes seem a little bit annoying. Half past 11, and I hope the same happens to Alison's son as well. I hope he reaches a point in his life where he realises how lucky he was to have a mum who cared so much about his welfare, even when he 
um, clearly and, and, and plainly resented her for it. Uh, Thomas Watts is here now with your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. 26 minutes to 12. I, I'm not sure she knows that we were talking about her um, uh, belief that Unhinged Headline had run its course while she was on holiday last week. But we, we, we've had a chat about it and we've decided that Unhinged Headline has not run its course. However, Smear Keir has, because attempts to smear Keir Starmer in the run-up to the general election were, of course, designed by the right-wing media to prevent him from being elected. Criticism of the Prime Minister now, of course, is a very different thing. So, shortly, I think I will play you the rather jolly um, and possibly my all-time favourite jingle for what will probably be the final time. But we are confident that with a little bit of uh, editorial oversight, we do not need to say goodbye to... Unhinged Headline! Largely thanks to the work of Alistair Heath, the editor of the Sunday Telegraph and a columnist on the Daily Telegraph. If I can ever be bothered, I'll put together a top ten of headlines that are the very definition of unhinged, by far the most unhinged uh, headline monger, and I know that the writer doesn't write the headlines themselves, but the sub-editor usually gets a fairly clear idea of what's wanted from the copy that appears below the headline. And and this is, I, I mean, just think back over the last 14 years. Think what we've learned about Grenfell in the last 24 hours. And Alice Heath chooses today in the Daily Telegraph, inevitably, to write this right under this headline. Starmer is leading the nastiest, most vicious government in a generation. Now, that's a generation that would include Jacob Rees-Mogg as a government minister, describing people who died in Grenfell Tower as having lacked common sense. It would include a prime minister reportedly calling for the bodies to pile high rather than inconvenience the lives of of people like him. It's a, it's, a, it's a generation that saw more penalties issued to Downing Street during lockdowns or for behaviour, for breaches of lockdown rules than any other address in the entire country. It's a generation that saw an actual Home Secretary reveal that she dreamed of seeing genuine refugees and asylum seekers being deported forever to Rwanda. It's a generation that gave us Nadine Dorries as a Secretary of State for Culture, Media and Sport. But no, Starmer is leading the nastiest, most vicious government in a generation. So for now at least, thanks largely to Alistair Heath, this is safe. Unhinged headline. But this, I'm afraid, is something of a swan song. Smear here, smear here. Smear here. Shall we play the long version just as a as a fond and final farewell? I think we should. Smear here, smear here. It's the only one I've ever danced to, I think. And you can see me dance on YouTube. <laughs> Don't forget to subscribe and ring that bell. Is there a bell? I, I do, I, every time I've got to go and have a look at it, actually. I, is there a bell on you? Can you ring that bell? You Subscribe to YouTube. Don't forget to subscribe. 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 Don't forget to subscribe. That's what they all do, isn't it? I, I, my, one of my godsons was looking at something the other day, and, and he had 313 million subscribers. First of all, I didn't know you could watch YouTube on my telly just by pressing a couple of buttons, but my nine-year-old godson comes in and just goes, bing, 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 and there it is. And I know that's a little bit remiss of me, but I never feel the need to watch YouTube on my telly, although perhaps I should start watching this. Me, as in, you yeah. uh, know. And, and secondly, I said, what do you want to watch? And he said something, and I, God, Andrea Jenkins, yeah, flipping, flipping gestures at members of the public of course but no Keir Starmer the worst what is it the nastiest most vicious government in a generation um and then he said I want to watch this so we'll put it on I said I looked at the screen I said how many subscribers has he got and the lad says cool as you like 313 million Uncle James 313 million subscribers how many people are there in the world Obviously more than 330, but they're just extraordinary. So it's time I up my game. It's time I up my game on YouTube. So this time next year, Rodney, we'll have, we'll have 313 million. No, we won't, but we might have a few more than we have now. Uh, 11.38 is the time. Daniel's in Mitcham. To take us back to this, this question of whether or not expulsion stroke suspension is the worst thing possible for the kids on the receiving end of it, but 
Is it the best thing possible for everybody else? What do you think, Daniel? It's a really, really difficult question to answer. It really is. I understand, yeah, the plight of the teachers are that they have so many young people that they have to kind of cater for and they have to make sure it's a safe environment for them to learn and be educated. But equally, on the other side, when young people are excluded from schools, they rarely ever get back into mainstream education. Yeah. And as a result, their life chances are basically truncated. Now, I, I worked in various different capacities with young people over like past 11 years. Um, I actually did work as a targeted youth support worker, so I was working with young people who were at the edge of being excluded from schools permanently to try and stop that from happening. Who calls you in? So, when I was... Can I mention the borough? Uh, yeah, of course you can. Yeah, so it was the London Borough of Sutton. Um, basically, there was a restructure, which basically meant that... Um, the schools had to kind of put money together in a pot with the local authority to right. try and create a youth service which was tailored to trying to stop young people from, first of all, being excluded from schools, but also from being uh, removed from their homes and placed oh. in local authority care So, the, well. school, so the school or the social services would sort of activate you and your colleagues? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. yeah that's how it works. I've got that's a horrible feeling. I know how this ends with, with cuts and austerity and the cessation of the service. Yeah, oh. you know exactly how oh, it ends. Yeah. Boy. I, I wish yeah. I was wrong, Daniel, well, as, as no, you know. But let's go back to when you were doing it and the kind of child, and obviously we're going to generalise a bit, mm -hmm. that, that you encountered when you turned up to help. So we had to kind of take a holistic look at all of the young people that we were working with. And as you can imagine, there was there was turbulence in the private life. Sometimes it was because of parents that didn't show too much interest. They weren't necessarily emotionally available. It may have also been because they kind of dealt with some kind of a tragedy in their life. I remember working with young person, one young person who was excluded um, because his behaviour was unmanageable, but his mum had been given a cancer diagnosis. Oh, not long before. Well, Alison's boy had lost his dad, hadn't he? But the yeah, school may yeah. not even have been fully aware of that. Or every teacher every year wouldn't have known that, would they? Well, the teacher that excluded him eventually because he was excluded was fully aware of that. Oh. Um, and I think they were using our service as, um, because in order to exclude, you need to be able to kind of show that you've put in a, a number of different interventions to show that you've tried your best. And sometimes people don't act in good faith mm. and they use your service as a means of saying, see, we put this in place and that didn't work. So now we can exclude. What I wanted to say though, because I, because I also worked on the other side, I was, um, I worked as a supply teacher and, Anybody knows supply teachers going to schools, they probably get some of the worst behavior in classrooms. Yeah, but sure. um, I was I was fine actually. It was it was really really good, and I kind of tried to strike up a relationship with young people almost immediately through humor. But more importantly, I think this could could be helpful is the way in which you engage young people um, has a massive difference. I say you, but I mean all of us. I think if I engage a young person. Um, who has problematic behavior as inherently problematic, they pick up on that. They're, they're not silly, they're not stupid. They understand how they're being treated and they may play into that kind of stereotype. I think if you give them responsibility and you try to build a relationship with them, then you start to kind of reimagine who they, they are. But then you, you need a lot of time and space to do that, don't you? you not, not necessarily, not okay. always. I mean, sometimes it could have been as simple as we were reading... I don't know, like uh, Dracula um, yeah. in like an English class and we're just kind of giving up um, roles for people to read and maybe you you engage with young people and put on like a playful voice or something along the lines of that and you try and see if you can encourage some of the young people that maybe would disrupt to, to take part. And if you set an example, for instance, by using a silly voice, it kind of shows that actually we can be creative and I'm not going to penalise you for doing the exact same thing and then there can be more engagement. They may not necessarily learn as much about the, the topic as they can, but as, as we, we're trying to teach them, but at least they kind of buy into the idea that we're doing this together. What, what would, I, I, I don't want to be glib, but we are a bit short of time and I've got, I've got Henry Riley waiting to report on some interesting new developments with regards to the, the, the sewage situation in our waterways. Describe a success mm -hmm. to me. Describe one of your successes from your days doing, more so the, mm -hmm. the, the um, exclusion than the teaching when you were called in by the sure. school. What would a success look like? So a success, success that I had would have been when I was working with one young person yeah. who was excluded from the school in Sutton and went to a local pupil referral unit um, and he was, he was a really really nice guy but he just had 
um, some personal issues that he was really, really kind of struggling with. And we worked together. We built a relationship. I used to take him to a local boxing club in Sutton and we used to kind of do um, activities there. It, it was also, can I shout out the, the club because it's a really, really great place. And they, yeah. Thanks they for checking people as well. I appreciate that. Of course you can. No worries. So it's called Raptor Strike Force Martial Arts. The, the guy who owns it, his name is Wayne. And he knew that I couldn't pay him as such initially, but he let me bring young people down there because he understood he understood basically that we need to kind of have a place for young people to be. Mm. Um, and so we were able to kind of develop a relationship around positive activities, um, able to exercise as well, um, able to kind of use that as a segue into understanding what life was like for him and feeding that back to social workers, schools and so forth and so on. And he managed to get back into a mainstream school. Well, that's, I mean, that's jackpot. And, and as we've yeah. already established, some of the people that were going to do that are, are no longer able to do it, yourself included, because of um, uh, that political ideology built upon the idea that the global financial crisis in 2008 was caused by there being too many people like Daniel working with excluded pupils in Sutton. Thank you, Daniel. I, I warned you I needed to be brief because Henry Riley has, uh, is in Putney, in fact, where Steve Reid, the Environment Secretary, has just been setting out his new water bill. There is a thirst, if you'd pardon the pun, for actual legislation, and there is an urgent need, as Fergal Schalke has frequently reminded us, Henry, of, of action in this sector precisely. So what has happened? Well, James, good morning. Joining you from the Thames Boat Club, which, of course, Steve Reid has chosen this location in Putney because this is where the Oxford-Cambridge boat race happens. And he was outraged, as he said in his speech, that for the first time this year, there were restrictions because of an E. coli outbreak, pollution and sewage in the Thames that meant the event had to be uh, scaled back, of course, even this morning, actually, James, as I speak. I'm on the balcony. There are still people donning their lycra and heading into kayaks and canoes. So the River Thames obviously used on a frequent basis. The main headline from Steve Reid's speech, there were sort of four main components, but really was getting tough with regards water bosses. As he set out in his speech, he's not afraid to try and send them to jail. This bill will make it easier for the Environment Agency to bring criminal charges. It will create new, tougher penalties, including imprisonment for water companies if companies obstruct Environment Agency and Drinking Water Inspectorate investigations. So if there is an investigation, Steve Reid making it clear you cannot obstruct it. The other three things, very quickly, James, the fines, currently £300 um, for pollution breaches. That will rise because at the moment, for the sort of minor breaches, it's simply not enforced. The third thing, uh, storm overflows, currently non-emergency ones are monitored. That's around 14,000. They'll now monitor the 7,000 emergency overflows. And then lastly, with regards bonuses, CEOs and senior leadership, if they fail the consumer, if they fail the environment, um, they will not get their bonus. In the case of Liv Garfield, she got a bonus of 584000 last year from Seven Trent, despite that yeah, particular company facing a £2 million fine. So, James, has Steve Reid really getting tough on water bosses and the water companies? Do we know what Fergal thinks? No, well, Chris Packham was here. I know it's not Fergal Sharkey, but he was, he was nodding away during the speech. Fergal Sharkey um, says that it doesn't quite go far enough, but, uh, I mean, Fergal Sharkey wants to see more regulation, for example, but Steve Reid sort of made clear in his speech, look, this is the start of it, and then as part of this government of service, we will eventually get there. So the message to Fergal is be patient. Lovely stuff. Give our love to Chris, won't you? Will do. Uh, he's still here, so I will, I will go no, make and see sure, him. I'm serious. Make sure you do. He's a great showbiz charm of mine. Yeah. Thank you, Henry. You guys, I'm introducing him to all my top contacts. Uh, you can hear my full disclosure interviews, of course, with Fergal Shockey and Chris Packham uh, via Global Player. Uh, Henry Riley there, live in Putney, where Steve Reid, the Environment Secretary, has just been setting out this new water bill, which, um, uh, well, it seems to reach some of the parts that previous bills have failed to reach. Up next, um, I'm going to introduce you to a, a, a journalist and author, a Pulitzer Prize winner, no less, who has dug a little deeper than I think anybody else so far into what she describes as, um, uh, well, autocracy incorporated, or crucially, the dictators who want to run the world. And it, it, it's, it, well, it's, it's fascinating. It's quite prob possibly urgent 
as well. 11.48 is the time. James O'Brien on LBC. It's 11.52 and um, time to get quite serious before we get rather silly after 12 o'clock with Mystery Hour because, as you know, I've, I've mentioned a few times a sense of the tectonic plates of our world order shifting beneath our feet. And, of course, the, the thing about tectonic plates is that you, you, you don't always notice it in, in the moment. You only notice it when um, uh, the effects have essentially crystallized. Anne Applebaum's new book, Autocracy, Inc., The Dictators Who Want to Run the World, I think plays pretty powerfully into this sense of, of something rather significant changing in the way that the world works or in the way that uh, countries do business. And, and Anne joins me now. Y you identify autocracies, centralized autocracies. W what is a centralized autocracy and what is different about what you analyse here compared to what we might describe ourselves as being used to? So the book describes a network, uh, a group of dictatorships who do not share a common ideology. So we're talking about communist China and nationalist Russia and theocratic Iran and, I don't know, Bolivarian socialist Venezuela and whatever North Korea is. <laughs> I was waiting to see what <laughs> adjective you were going to apply to North Korea after that whatever. sort of ideological... <laughs> sort of, yeah. but, they, but the point is they're very different. I mean, yes. some of them believe in God and some of them don't and some of them want to build utopia and some of them don't. And, and some, um, but, they, but they are all countries led either by a single person or by a ruling party who seek to rule without checks and balances, without press, without independent courts, without transparency, without accountability. Um, and they have begun to cooperate uh, together, both to make sure that they can all continue to rule that way. Um, and in, these are all, many of them, very, very wealthy people. These are billionaires to, to stay in power, to keep their money. Um, and also to make sure that ideas that would challenge their rule um, don't win the argument. So what's what, are, what do they not like? They don't like the rule of law. They don't like the language of liberal democracy. They don't like accountability. They don't like rights. They don't like human rights. And they don't like it... It sounds like they could be running for the leadership of the Conservative <laughs> Party if we're going to stick with that checklist. <laughs> that, well, I mean, you don't have to be... Well, there's one of the arguments of the book is you don't have to live in Russia or China sure. to, to, to feel this way. And that, But they have this... That they don't want to hear it, and they would like to push back against it, both inside their own countries and increasingly around the world. Well, crucially, around the world. Our, our mutual friend Bill Bradder unlocked the mystery of Putin for me when he just described the simple necessity of holding on to his stolen money. And mm -hmm. that, 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 that that's a lot of it. Uh, explaining a lot, a, lot of, of it. a lot of the of the mission that's in place. But as you point out, that won't necessarily well probably does actually apply to almost all of the regimes that that, that you describe and identify in the book. The, the, I mean, the corollary of this is the disappearance or the diminishment of what we would once have called the liberal world. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, that, 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 I think you feel, has gone effectively as a, as not, a homogenous no, no, it's, force. It's, it's not gone, um, but it, it lacks some strategic thinking and organization. I mean, the fact that the democratic world, however broadly you describe it, actually, the, uh, was able to unite in the defense of Ukraine mm. um, over the last couple of years is evidence that it's still there and that people there are still uh, things that we have in common. But we haven't really got to the next level of thinking about how we're going to compete in terms of information, in terms of technology, um, uh, you know, and, and also, you know, are we going to defeat um, the, the the kleptocracy that they represent? Because the, what, because some of what they do ha is is here. I mean, so. You know, this isn't like a Cold War situation where there's, you know, Berlin Wall and it divides good guys from bad line. There's some kind of geographic division. Mm. So the behaviors that they promote, we have also here in London, you know, in the form of anonymously owned property all over the city, which is where, I don't know, Chinese or Malaysian or uh, Angolan billionaires hide their money. And so fighting, fighting them, part of it is changing our own system too. Is London more um, 
dirtier, if you like? Is London dirtier in this field than, than many there, others? You have competition. Right. Uh, you know, you, you know, Luxembourg. <laughs> there's, there's competition, but it's certainly a feature of life here. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's something that we've come to accept as normal, you know, almost as if it was like a natural rock formation. Like there is this thing of anonymous companies and they just exist, anonymously owned companies, and we can't do anything about it. I mean, it's ridiculous. We could make them illegal. We could make people present a passport when they create a company. Yes. Um, and there's some movement in that direction, but it could be more definitive. Further and faster. Um, I, I, I think Donald Trump inevitably pops up mm. at this point in the conversation because, uh, A, he certainly has demonstrated some ambitions perhaps or some dreams of, of being an autocrat, and, B, that's the downside of the Ukraine model, isn't it, is what might have happened Mm -hmm. Had he been in the White House when, mm -hmm. when, when Putin um, sent his tanks to, to Kiev? He, he, he certainly likes the idea of ruling without courts and without press. I mean, he says so. Mm. Um, and he certainly... And he, and he publicly admires a lot of the people that are currently and, doing well, that's so. Also, in, and he's also fundamentally transactional, which is what they are as well. Um, so his interest is in staying in power, making more money, keeping his money. You know, in that sense, he's like them. And he's also not very much not interested, and he says this repeatedly in many different ways, in being the leader of some kind of democratic alliance that will push back against kleptocracy. Mm. So, um, so and if not America, then who? Then if not America, then who? It's a good question. I mean, there's, there isn't really another country that has that kind of power. I mean, you could imagine some league of Europeans sure. emerging in that role, and maybe that would happen. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to give Europeans no agency, but, but it's, uh, uh, you know, it's true that without the U.S., it's harder. I should stress, because otherwise the analysis would be unbearably bleak, that you do offer up a uh, solution, well, if not a solution, then certainly a prescription for improvement. Well, there, you know, there, there's, there's no such thing as inevitability in history. There is no inevitable reason why our civilization declines and there's rises. I mean, there's a, you mm. know, there, there, we choices that we make, are, are today affect what happens tomorrow. Um, and th again, thinking about coalitions, thinking about a, a coalition to push back against kleptocracy, thinking also, also by the way, about working with the opponents of the autocracies. I mean, actually, almost everything I know about kleptocracy and even about London comes from the Russian opposition. I mean, they're the ones yeah. who, who studied this and figured it out. I mean, it's not an accident that Browder knows about it because that's where he learned about it. Mm. Um, and and un listening to them because they understand their regimes um, better than uh, much better than we do. Um, but they're even, you know, you know, focusing on how to win the war in Ukraine, not just defend the Ukrainians, but win it. Um, focusing on, you know, cleaning up our own systems, um, thinking harder about social media and regulating it, by which I do not mean censoring it. I mean, applying the laws of real life to the online world or um, or giving people some control over their data, some access to the uh, control over algorithms. I mean, there are a lot of there are a lot of things we could be thinking about that we aren't focused on. Um, which brings me to my final question. And I, I suspect you delivered your manuscript before the full extent of Elon Musk's impact upon yes. Twitter had, had become clear because hmm. he, he gets, I think, just one mention in the book. How significant a player is he in the processes you, that, that you're describing in the book, actually and potentially? So, yes, certainly the idea that one of our major social media platforms is now controlled by somebody who is both amplifying Russian propaganda and amplifying far-right propaganda, and it seems deliberately seeking to create dissent and division here in Britain as well as as well as elsewhere. Very much so. Especially is, here in Britain. Especially, especially here is a, is a is a new, is a new development of a kind I just don't think we've thought through yet. Mm. Um, and um, you know, how, you know, but again. It's not a. It's not as if he's a force of nature that can't be controlled. You know, we regulate all kinds of industries. We regulate the financial industry. We you know we think about how, you know do you know how to make social media compatible with democracy, um, and with our form of of uh, you know with the need for good debate. I mean, it seems to me a completely legitimate subject for 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 discussion. In, you know, in parliaments everywhere. Urgent. Not urgent. Just, not just legitimate. Urgent. And, and indeed, one comes away from the book with, with, a, with a sense of, of the urgency of some of these issues being addressed sooner rather than later. Um, Autocracy Inc., uh, the dictators who want to run the world. 
It's, it's quite nice to have winner of the Pulitzer Prize on the front cover of your book, <laughs> isn't it? And I have to tell you, I won the Pulitzer Prize 20 years ago, it's, and they've been sticking it on book covers ever fresh, since. Anne. It's box it's fresh, Anne. It's box fresh. 20 years. <laughs> We've there 200 years from now. Um, and, and, and Apple Brand, many thanks indeed for your time. And, and, and the book comes highly, highly recommended um, uh, by me. Thank, Thank you. you. It is 12.01. James O'Brien on LBC. A moment, if you would, of self-congratulation. I know what you're thinking. What do you mean a moment? You spend three hours doing it every day. But isn't it nice to be able to move so so effortlessly through the territory that we've explored together today, from the tragedy of Grenfell to the uh, to the seriousness, but the largely experience-based analysis of ex- excluding and expelling and suspending children from school to Anne Applebaum's extraordinarily important new book. Um, and now to the absurdity and silliness of Mystery Hour, not to mention stopping off halfway through that journey to... Uh, spend 15 minutes talking to the Deputy Prime Minister, Angela Rayner. I, 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 I do sometimes have days where I think, oh, we're doing all right, aren't we? And we played un- Unhinged Headline as well. So thank you for keeping me company as we uh, continue to, um, what's the word we want, to address the new Britain, the sort of post-Tory period into which we are now moving. Happily, some things stay the same. And top of that list is Mystery Hour, your weekly opportunity to achieve the sort of satisfaction not ordinarily available anywhere else on your radio dial. Uh, you can ring in with a question, a mystery, a conundrum, a riddle, something that needs to be solved, something you know must admit an answer, but you're dashed if you know what that answer is. 03456060973. And then you can ring in with a answer then you can ring in with the um answer to the question that someone else has asked you're not allowed to look stuff up obviously my favorite contribution of the week will win a brand new mystery hour board game which is a real thing and an awful lot of fun in fact i can prove it to you go to mysteryhour.co.uk now go on i'll wait mysteryhour.co.uk where you can see and learn more and crucially buy your very own Mystery Hour board game. However, you can get one for free if you make my favourite contribution of the week. Uh, Terms and conditions at lbc.co.uk. I think that's it, isn't it? Let's just crack on, shall we? Uh, 12.07 is the time. David is in Edgeware. David, question or answer? You know, James, I've always thought that if I'm first on, I'm going to be funny and say answer, but I'm realising now it's not particularly funny, so it's a question. <laughs> <laughs> let, let David be an example to us all. Carry on. Carry on, David. Uh, uh, news agents or corner shops, those yes. sort of places, how do they make money? Uh, you, you never see anyone doing a full shop in there. They're often, you know, right by a big supermarket. Yes. And pe- people go in and buy a drink or a, you know, a chocolate bar. They're never full. I think. Well, I I I think part of the answer is probably breach of uh, employment regulations because they they are largely family owned. I think that's the type that you're talking about, rather than a a a sort of a chain, and they're just open all the time. So uh, I've I've thought about this a lot with places near me. So. I don't know what the hourly rate for the person working there would be, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was actually below minimum wage sometimes or below the London living wage, but it's enough to keep the business up and running. But when you consider the, you know, these places in busy areas where rent is probably quite high, unless they own the, the building, there'll be some of that, that there. There'll be. I mean, I, I mean, I mean, the short answer is they make they make a profit in the same way that everybody else does. But the but the idea that. Because you, you're like me, you sometimes think I haven't seen anyone in there for for, for yeah, half an hour. It'll be next to you know a, a big. So we, we'll a speak to someone who runs one. Kind of we, we'll speak to someone who runs one and ask them what the what the kind of rough SP is on 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 how well they do. I would have thought they're more under threat from delivery services than perhaps we appreciate because you, you know you the, the little things you need that you haven't got in your big weekly shop, you're going to pop to your local shop to get and pay a small premium for. That you know more than you'd pay in your big supermarket, but but now you've got the um, yeah, you've you got just the, get them at your fingertips. Well, big cities you do. I don't. I don't think Mum can have her groceries sort of delivered for free, uh, like tiny tiny amounts delivered for free. I mean, the delivery yeah. thing might help them to one aspect because the only time we go to our news agent is to pick up a package that we've we've had delivered. Oh, that's there. true. But yeah, um, but you so don't. You, what about help, booze? But... Booze and cig- cigarettes? 
No, yeah, well... That's quite yeah, big. Uh, but how, how much can they sell? You know, when you're considering down the road you've got a Tesco Express or something like that... And well, we have. You're, you're in Edgeware. Well, no, that's true, because the shops are there as well. I, so, I, I, how, how, how is business for the average family corner shop in a, in a town or a city, is what you're asking? Well, yeah, I'm sure a lot of people say it's, it's, it's a struggle, but I want to know how do any of them make enough money to keep going? Yeah, OK, that's a fair... It's, I mean, it's a little bit off the Mystery Hour beaten track, but hey, what, what is the point of having beaten tracks if you never go off them or something? David, thank you. Finn's in leak. Uh, Finn, question or answer? Oh, good afternoon, James. It's actually Tim. Um, it's a question, but just before just before I do that, I got permission off the producer just to say a massive, massive thank you to you and all of the production team for the Mystery Hour because I was very seriously ill a couple of years ago, open heart surgery, mm. and the podcast really, really got me through. I've done the five hundred at least three times each. Good lord. Uh, yeah. The only trouble now is it's like watching The Great Escape. I can mount the words, but uh, but I certainly enjoy. What was the it? Do you one. think that, that that you found so soothing? Because I, I mean, listening to everything once, it, it, I can get my head around. But what what was it that made you, particularly during that time of, of needing distraction, that that made it work as a as a repeat offer? Do you think? Well, this, this is a compliment rather than an insult, but it used to help me drift off to sleep. So very often I wouldn't actually hear a complete episode. Oh, I see. And then I'd kind of wake up at five in the morning and I'd think, what's he talking about, David so Cameron, the Prime Minister? <laughs> <laughs> so you'd fill in some of the gap. What a lovely compliment. I thank you, Tim. And I'm, I'm glad that you've, um, I'm, well, I'm glad that you're better. I'm glad that you've made a recovery. Question or answer? And a question, please. Carry on. Uh, and it's a second time caller. Another question about heat, and it relates to one of your things on the Mystery Hour about being a hungry student on a building site and uh, ordering yourself a Coke and the rest of the crew had a cup of tea and they all yes, laughed at you. That's and, right. and I think the principle behind it being that hot drinks raise your core temperature so they'll cool you down in the summer. So my question is actually the converse of that. So if hot drinks keep you cool in the summer, uh, would a cool drink sort of be better for you in the winter so should we be drinking sort of tea in the summer or having an ice cream having a lolly yeah having having a lolly and and linked to that i know i'm only allowed one question but linked to that does it also apply to food so should we be having curries and stews in the summer and salads in in the winter and perhaps that's why curries are such a big thing in asia uh so so yeah my question so you mean chili heat rather than heat heat yeah, that's right. You know, so so. Uh, it Gosh, does, so you raise your core temperature by eating lots of chili, and it actually, no, you cool yourself down by eating lots of chili, and that's why they're popular in. And I think it's more to do with the. Well, no, I don't know. I don't, what a great question! I wonder whether you could have come up with that question if you hadn't inhaled the whole Mystery Hour archive on at least three occasions. Pro- probably not. No, uh, as I say, I, I, I know uh, I can mouth the words to the 500 now. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't do that in public. No, no, absolutely not. 12-12 12, 12 is the time. Tim, thank you, mate. That's lovely stuff. So so I, I, I think it's true. The, and the anecdote, I only have about 12 anecdotes. He's referring to the Doncaster building site period of my anecdote uh, archive. And that was, uh, various stories come from that for fortnight. It must be one of the longest fortnights ever. And... The, the idea that having a hot drink when you're hot actually cooled you down more than a cold drink did. Something that I discovered when all the lads on the building site sent me to the cafe to buy them teas and they told me to get myself a drink and I got myself a Coca-Cola. And they, I, Anyway, that, does the opposite happen? It, it, when, I am, when I am cold, if I drink something cold, would it activate my body to start heating me up? I, 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 just, I just kind of doubt it, but we'll see. 0345 606973 is the number that you need. I got a couple of phone lines free. I don't know why. I don't know whether. Have you, have you just. Have you in one of those moods? Have you been t- 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 answering the phones and telling people to sling their hooks? Or. Uh, no, it was, it was full two seconds ago, but now we've got three phone lines free. So 0345 606973 is the number you need if you can answer either of the questions that have already been asked or if indeed you have a question of your own. Don't text me complaining about not being able to get through every week when I give you these heads ups when the, when the unexpected. Is that the correct use of the plural there? Heads ups? No, heads ups. It's a heads up. The plural of heads up is heads ups. Surely, heads ups. Sounds like it's got a Z in the middle. I like that. Heads ups. Um, if I give you all these heads ups on the rare occasions when there are sort of gaps in the in the switchboard. Nev's in healing. Nev, question or answer? Hi, James. It's a question. Yes. Okay. Um, in old movies and in, in 
in comics that I might have read when I was a kid, yeah, uh, like the Beano or whatever, Wizard and Chips, that was the kind of thing I liked. Same here, um, actually. I loved Wizard yeah. and Chips. Uh, did yeah. I ever have Mustafa Millions in it? Uh, I can't quite remember that. I, I remember Lord Snooty. That's the Beano. That's the Beano, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Right, anyway, kids. go on. Yeah, but in those, uh, those uh, comics and uh, in early movies... Prisoners would often be depicted as wearing uniforms with arrows on them. Yes, they would. And I want my question is, if that actually happened in prisons, why did they put the arrows on them? I think I know that. I think I think okay. it, I think it's actually quite obvious when you think about it. Well, yeah, okay, okay. I think I might have an idea too. It's because if they escaped, they'd be quite easily recognisable. Yes. Uh, until they managed to yeah. nick some clothes. Yeah, I, but I wonder if they actually did put arrows on them at any point. Well, you'd need a very distinctive uniform that everybody wore. But, yeah, yeah. The, the idea, did they actually have arrows? Did they? Have, I mean, you've gone for two questions now, uh, so, which is uh, you know, not, not to be encouraged. So, the, the, uh, yeah, so did, did they ever have arrows on them? I think they did, but that, that, let's do that question then. We'll ignore the... Um, Ignore my Why? answer. No, the one with so did did prisoners ever wear uniforms adorned with arrows? Yeah, you're on. Okay, thank you. I like you. it, and it was Wizard and Chips for Mustafa Millions. Enzi's been in touch okay. to confirm. <laughs> I loved that one. I don't know why that one stuck in my mind. Thank you, Nev. Uh, prisoners and arrows, hot foods and hot people, and corner shops. It's all there today, like a brimful of Asher. It's twelve sixteen. James O'Brien on LBC. 18 is the time how do corner shops make money I, and it might sound like a slightly strange question that but it wouldn't have been if you'd heard david ask it do, do does eating hot or spicy food cool you down when you're very hot in in hot climates and why or did prisoners uniforms ever feature arrows all of those and more to come sarah is in stow market sarah question or answer question please carry on sarah um, when you watch, when I watch intricate operations on the telly... When you watch what on the telly? Intricate operations. Intricate operations? How That's often do you watch intricate operations um, on the telly? Not a lot, okay. but when right. I do... Right. But when I do... Yes. When they make the incision with the scalpel, right. why doesn't it bleed a lot? What? Are we talking about living people? Yeah, living people. But, you know, you some, I sometimes watch those... I don't know, a company that called um, Intricate Operations, anyway. Yeah. And when they... But why is it different? I mean, by intricate, I, see intricate, I mean, surely any old operation involves yeah, a scalpel. Okay. Right. Well, any operation, but when they cut into the skin with the scalpel, yeah. it never seems to bleed. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, are you sure about this? Yes. I watched one the other day, and a poor bloke was having his back um, ripped apart with the scalpel. And, I mean, if I cut myself, it bleeds. Well, probably yeah, but if you prick yourself, it bleeds. Yeah. But if you but cut, if you cut yourself, it probably. I don't. Yeah, you're right. If you cut yourself chopping tomatoes or something like that, yeah. there's blood all over the place. Exactly. Well, don't exactly. say exactly like that because I'm still not accepting your premise that it doesn't happen on intricate operations on the television. Well, perhaps there is a surgeon listening to your program. Well, I, yeah, and it, I mean, I suppose either we can confirm the fundamental premise of your question, and then we can. If it is true, then we can answer it. But I don't. I, you normally you jog my memory with something like that, and I can't. I don't. I don't. I thought you were talking about post mortems. You see on the television. Or no, something. no, no, no. I think I think I would know that that would. Yeah, right. Be. That's why I thought it'd be easier to answer. I said, but no, I don't know. All right, you're on. So apparent. Apparently, when you watch an intricate operation on the television, the scalpel, uh, the incision is made, and there is not the. Uh, amount of blood that we might otherwise expect and uh, actually quite a lot of support coming in for for sarah's claim so probably the claim is correct so what is the answer to the question Twelve twenty one is the time colin is in rice lip colin question or answer it's a question james carry on royalty um, royalty people, yes that are in the public eye like you had the queen mother died she did uh, the queen passed over prince philip yes now, they had a wardrobe of clothes phenomenal yeah. But where do they go? Because if you've got a relative that passes away, you normally bag up their bits and bobs and take them to a charity shop. You do. But what happens to the amount of handbags, coats, Nothing shoes better. that the Queen had? Where do they all go? There must have been hundreds of them. That's a very interesting question. What have you got your eye on? What are you looking out for? 
Nothing. I'm, I'm, I'm on holiday this week, and I'm having to wait till I'm on holiday before I can answer the question. And I've been going in my mind forever. But you, you never ever see the Queen wear the same outfit, maybe more than twice. You did. No, that's not true. That she was the original outfit repeater. All right, but so Daily so Mail had entire teams, crack teams, dedicated to pointing out that she last wore this dress in 1974. The Queen was an extra... Well, I say the Queen. I mean, she's got I mean, ladies-in-waiting, wardrobe mistresses, got servants coming out of her ears. Well, that's but, what I mean. But, so where did all the clothes go? After and she passed the away. Mother and Prince uh, Philip as well. Well, I, sometimes these things end up in the... Um, Albert, uh, Not the Albert Hall. What am I thinking? The Albert yeah, and Victoria Museum, museum yeah. don't they? The thing that made me ask this question yes. was... That, um, the king now was recycling some curtains from old palaces into other things, wasn't he? Do you remember that? The king, king, the king was recycling old curtains into yeah, what sort of what trousers, and covers, and things like that as he replaced them. That's not I quite quite like that actually. And uh, it made me wonder what happened to all the clothes. Well, I, I mean, I, I know she gave them some to her servants. I remember doing something on that when I was a gossip columnist 20 odd years ago that that was not unheard of for dressers to get some of the clothes but you're talking about after she passed yes what happened to her capacious wardrobe it's a good yeah. question that mate yeah. okay oh well done it was worth taking a holiday for that I think it was just indeed That's just, okay. just for that, for that cheers Colin um I don't know who'd know the answer to that and if people did know the answer to it, they might not be allowed to ring me but there it is what happened to the the late queen or the late queen mother's fairly large wardrobes 0345 606 is the number that you need this is true um from mike you might not think it but it is queen victoria's underwear often comes up for auction i can't remember why that is but there was a story not long ago about why that um why that was actually a thing bob's in tavistock bob question or answer it's a it's a question for you james carry on bob uh, okay and it's regarding uh electric toothbrushes Oh yeah, and the tr- and how they charge? You bloody don't. Well, I I I, ha- I have an electric toothbrush, yes. and in order to charge it, yes, it sits on a little plastic pedestal. But as far as I can see, it's more of a no- nipple. It's more of a nipple than a pedestal. Well, I was going to say nipple, but I wasn't. I wasn't sure whether you dump. I can't dump you. I can't dump button. you for saying nipple, Bob. What do you think this is? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a perfectly reasonable because a pedestal for me is a flat surface, surface even. That's as may be, but like, say for example, if you wanted to charge a car battery up, for, in order for the electrons to throw to, to flow, you need yes. good contact, don't you? You do. Whereas a toothbrush sits on a little plastic thing, and as far as a I nipple, can see, a there's nipple, no a little plastic exactly nipple. a little a little plastic nipple, and <laughs> and there's no there's no metal contact. So no. How, how how does it charge? How do the electrons end up? I I flowing? do you want the good news or the bad news? Go on. The bad news. Uh, the bad news is uh, I, that we, I think, have had this question before. But the good news is that I know the answer. That's just that it's it's only from having done it before that I know the answer. It's not from okay. particular. Why do you sound so disappointed? I'm not. I'm waiting to be enlightened. Okay, stand by. It is uh, magnets. It's magnetic fields trans doing the power. So, oh, okay. you know, it's true. Keith is, is doing strange things with his phone, but you can do the same thing with your phone, can't you? You can put your phone on. Uh, I can't see, Keith. You should, I mean, how long have we worked together? These windows are, these windows are tinted. It's like a wireless charger. It's not, it's not unique to uh, toothbrushes. I've got a clock radio, would you believe, next to the bed that I can put my phone on top of, and it charges without me having to plug anything in. But what you've got is... Um, I don't want to say coils, but it is, I think it is coils. One in the nipple and one in the toothbrush. And when you put them together, it creates one circuit, as it were, and that charges up the battery in your toothbrush. I think it's called induct, mm. inductive charging. In, inductive? In, yeah, not conductive, inductive. Co- yeah, inductive. It's inductive as opposed to conductive. Well, every day's a school day. I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. Do you have any problems with your charger by any chance? Um, I don't because oh. I have a number. I have a number of toothbrushes. Do you? Um, you know, the, well, people, you know, we've had visitors and they leave them behind. And what electric toothbrushes? One, 
Yeah, yeah. Really? Don't you phone them up and tell them? They cost quite a lot of money, these these toothbrushes. Well, they, they do, but, you know, I've, I've, I've managed to acquire about three of the things. All right, all right. So, um, you know, I kind of leave I've got two problems with mine. I've got two Go problems on. with mine, Bob. The first is... I always forget that I've plugged it in. So I'll, I'll, I'll be, I've got so many bathrooms in my palace. I'll be mm. running around from bathroom to bathroom, desperately trying to find my electric toothbrush. And then I'll suddenly remember that I've plugged it in under the sofa in the bedroom. And the other problem I've got is it often doesn't work. I'm pretty sure it's worked. The lights seem to be on and it seems to be charging. And I come back the next morning and get ready to brush my teeth and it's, it's flat again. Mm. Oh, yeah. Do you never get that at all? No, no, I don't, no. Well, I never. You live and learn. And are you happy with the answer, Bob? Yeah, you've you've done exceptionally well. Well, that's very kind of you to say so. I'll take a round of applause, please, Keith. Okay. Thank you very much. Qualifications have done it before on Mystery Hour. Mystery Hour is becoming arguably the most um, uh, referenced source material for Mystery Hour, which I, I quite like that. I didn't used to like that. I used to get cross about that. I used to ban repetition, but hey, um, how the world turns. Jill's in Beckenham. Jill, question or answer? An answer about Can't... the convict's arrows. Oh, thank God you're here. What is it, Jill? Um, it's a, it was a symbol of government property. Um, uh, in the reign of William and Mary, uh, they told uh, the Earl of Romney, who is now Lord Sydney, that he must find a way of identifying government property Gosh. so that uh, to prevent theft. And um, his family crest was a downward-facing arrow, broad arrow. Right. And so he used that. Um, and all government property was stamped with the downward arrow. What an amazing answer. Yeah. <laughs> was that Philip Sidney? I, d- I don't know. Um, I don't well, know. It doesn't matter. It's it not relevant. So, uh, uh, qualifications? Qualifications? Qualifications was um, a couple of years ago, my husband and I were in Warwick. And there's a very lovely medieval building in Warwick um, called the Lord Leicester Hospital. Oh, yes. And on, on the wall in the hospital is the Sydney family crest. Right. And we were being shown round by a guide, and he said that's the origin of the downward arrow on convict's clothing. <sighs> Round of applause for Jill. Thank you. Great stuff. Thank you, Jill. I love that one. Uh, Oh, and look at that. Brought us in bang on time as well. It's coming up to half past 12. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Isaac is is doing that sort of damning with faint praise thing here, but I'll take it. He says, that was a surprisingly good stab at explaining induction, James. Thank you, Isaac. Uh, Tim Humphrey is here now with your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 12.33. We don't really do motoring issues on this programme, but there are a couple of stories around that I thought were quite interesting. Electric car sales rose by 10.8% in August, which was quite a lot. But the the, the really interesting story that I like was the number of children that ha- are now walking and cycling to school as a consequence of an ultra-low emissions zone. It, well, I don't think it was the London one. It was, it was another one. Um, but it's seen a really exponential increase in the number of children walking and cycling to school. So, you know, down with that sort of thing. Uh, back to mystery hour. Questions in need of answers include do, how do corner shops make money, given that, you know, the, the, the competition has increased. And uh, anyway, do, do, does hot stuff cool you down when you're hot in the way that. No, that's not right. Does cold stuff. Oh, anyway, you heard the question. I can't remember the details. Uh, we've done the prisons and the arrows. Sarah's convinced that, that people don't bleed much when surgeons cut them with scalpels. If that's true, why is that true? Where does all the where do all the clothes go when senior members of the royal family pass away? And I did the electric toothbrush one myself. Robin is in Manchester. Robin, question or answer? I have an answer for you, James. Carry on, Robin. The bleeding one. Oh, yes. um, bottom line is all tissues bleed when you cut them. Oh, exactly. But some... Some bleed more than others. Um, Hands and fingers, for example, and the scalp have a much bigger blood supply than areas such as the skin on your abdomen or your back. So when you cut into that, those will bleed more, obviously. So we're literally thinking, Sarah and I, that because our thumb bleeds so much when we chop it, when we cut it chopping onions... Then our buttocks Everything would bleed. bleed. Our blood, yes. our buttocks would bleed just as much if 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 a scalpel were to end up in our buttocks. Yes, there are also some nuances to it in the fact that we use some um, blades called diathermy, which actually seal off the blood vessels as they cut through cool, the tissue please. layers. 
Um, and in also in some areas, uh, the surgeons will use local anaesthetic that's infiltrated with adrenaline before they make the cut. So that will cause local constriction of blood vessels and prevent the bleeding um, when you cut it anyway. So it, it could be a number of factors, sight, instrument used and preventative measures such as adrenaline before the operation. I, I have qualifications. I am a surgeon. Cool beans. Um, I, so now, Eleanor thinks that we need another surgeon on, but I think you've now covered so much territory, possibly even more than you covered when you were speaking to her, that we don't... We do, but, but the thing about surgeons is they're like bloody bosses, aren't they? You wait ages for one to come along. And then Richard in Stoke-on-Trent, are you also a surgeon? Uh, I am, James, yeah. How are you? Do you? I'm very well. Do you know each other? Shall I introduce you, Richard? Uh, Robin, Robin, I, I, Richard? I don't. Morning, Robin. Hello. Mo- morning, Richard. Uh, do, yeah, you need to, do you need to add anything to what Robin said, do you feel, Richard? I think he's stolen my thunder slightly. I think I would agree with everything he said, which is that different parts of the body bleed in different amounts. Um, I think that if maybe your caller is referencing, perhaps if I was to make a large incision on your abdomen, it's surprising that you can cut through the very top layer of the skin um, and actually have relatively little bleeding. It's yeah. if you go deeper into the fat, that's when you get the, 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 uh... the more serious amounts of bleeding. And that's what, so what we tend to do is start to make a very superficial incision in the skin to begin with, which often doesn't bleed that much. And then you use the cautery diathermy device to cut through the fat and get through the deeper layers. So um, (laughs) that's generally how it is. Great work, lads. Seriously, I can't remember the last time a double... I I can't remember the last time we had a tag team as effective as this one. (laughs) That is every I dotted and every T crossed. But I need to pick a winner. So going from my pronunciation of the word buttocks, what film was I watching last night? Oh, I keep you the bag. Oh. Um, uh, Forrest Gump. Yay! Yeah, hey, who was Gump, that? Yes. Who, who was that? Richard or Robin? Robin, won. Robin, Robin gets won. a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll share it with Richard. That's very gracious <laughs> of you. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. 1237 is the time. It's a classic film, by the way. Uh, Farzana is in Romford. Farzana, question or answer? It's a question, James. Carry on. Um, I'd like to know if local wildlife birds know the difference in branded foods <laughs> um, <laughs> what but first of all what is this local wildlife birds that you speak of do you just mean birds wild birds just birds just yeah. wildlife birds Bird. so wildlife birds you know you say wild birds wildlife any old birds. Bir- no not wildlife birds just wild birds just any birds birds not, yeah any yeah. birds what's birds. wrong with bees um, not nothing wrong with bees. So I'm an amateur bird watcher, and yeah. I feed my local garden birds, um, and I know that they absolutely love suet pellets. Suet um, pellets. Yes, yes, and I've recently bought suet pellets from a different store. Right. Um, and there's been no action in the last three weeks. Um, the pellets look look exactly the same, same colour, same size, but it's just from a different shop. So. I just want to know if birds know the difference of brands of food. Well, it's not. I mean, they're not going to know the brand, are they? But they're going to know the recipe. So you, in a way, you've answered your own question, haven't you? To, to an extent. I mean, I've not looked at the ingredients or the recipe of these suet pellets, but I can't assume them to be very much different. Was, were they the no, same I price? Be wrong. Were they the same price? Very similar in price, oh, yeah. Okay, that, that theory has gone out the window. But so you've offered up two different varieties of suet pellets, yeah, and the birds have. About, the birds only go for one of them. I only go for one of them. That's the answer to your question. Is, uh, can so they, they tell the difference? The they must no. They, they do, don't know they the brand. They don't like tweet to each they other. Know the difference. Yeah, they know. Yeah, they know. So, oh, she's got. Oh, she's got own brand. We only yeah. like the premium stuff. They don't know the name of the brand, but the recipes. They must be different recipes. That could be. The, that could be the answer. Yeah, it is the answer. They must do uh, qualifications. I know this amateur wildlife bird watcher. And she tried yeah. it. She did an experiment in controlled circumstances with two different varieties of suet balls. Is that the correct phrase? Suet balls? Suet pellets. Suet pellets. And the birds only went for one of them. Have you swapped back yet? I've not swapped back yet. Well, that no. is that would be the control on your experiment, wouldn't it? Once yeah. you swap back, if the birds come back, then you've got, yeah. your, you've got your answer. But there must be slightly different um, recipes. But it must be. It's just that there's there's a lot of types of birds that come and love the suet pellets. So I'm just thinking, but not the why, but not the new suet pellets. Not this. Literally suet no pellets. no action at all. Not a dicky bird. 
nothing whatsoever. They but, go for the mixed seeds now over, rather hey? than the suet pellets. And were the mixed seeds there when the suet pellets, the old suet pellets were there? Yeah, absolutely. And always the suet pellets would get finished much, much faster and then they'd come back and for the mixed seeds happening. later on. It's well, I'll, not I'll, happening. I'll put it on the board. Okay. But don't forget that birds are notoriously pecky eaters. Yes, they are. Pecky eaters. Uh, That's too <laughs> brilliant. I've done two jokes there. I did not a dicky not a dicky bird and you didn't even notice and then I did pecky eaters and you just agreed yeah, okay. with me. I got the pecky eaters. All right, but you missed eaters. the dicky bird. Yeah, I did. Yeah. I did. Well, I, I nicked that off Kevin anyway. He sent that in. I passed. <laughs> I, I, okay. Oh, and I can recommend a book for you if you like. Yes, please. Because Florence, who rang in, I think last week or the week before, Florence Wilkinson has sent me a copy of her book, Wild City. It's called Encounters with Urban Wildlife. It, it only arrived this morning, but it is right up your street, I think. Lovely. And it Great. is uh, for you know, it's all about out the, the stuff we can find not just birds in, uh, but yeah. badgers in brighton bats mosquitoes that are unique to the london underground network there's something in here for everybody you're going to love it it's called it? wild I'm gonna city it wild city put it on your wild list city. Got right, it. ready or wildlife city as you would call it <laughs> <laughs> it's 12, Thanks, <laughs> thank you Fasana. it's 12 41 tim's at the, the cambridge services that's very specific isn't it? <laughs> it it is indeed yeah hello james lovely to talk to you likewise um, tim what have you got I'll, question or answer i've got a question for you yes I had something very weird happen in a mobile phone call with my wife a while ago, and I'd like to find out what it was. Right. Basically, um, we were just talking away, and like after after about a few minutes, I kind of thought she's she's starting to repeat herself here. Right. Um, I said so. You know, for the first time round, I was yes. Oh, really? Oh, wow. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Then it then after a couple of minutes, you know, she was starting to say the same things, and it was okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I know. Yeah, you told me. Yeah. Yeah, so you said. Yeah. yeah. Then she said exactly the same thing again and again. And it was like, y yes, dear. Yeah. Yes, yeah, I know. You t yes, you told me. Yeah. Right. Y yeah. Yeah, you told me. And mm -hmm. I was kind of starting to think that she might have lost the plot a bit after about 20 minutes yeah. of like this sort of three, three or four minute cycle going over and over and over. In the end, it's like, dear, are you okay? Is, it, is everything all right? Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking, what's, what's happening? And then um, I kind of thought, is, is this something technical? So I sort of established that, you know, <laughs> she wasn't going to be interrupted in this cycle. Yeah. So I, I just hung up and I phoned her back. And she said, um, is everything all right? She said, um, yeah, why? I said, well, about that phone call we've just had. Mm. She said, well, what about it? I said, well... You were kind of repeating yourself a bit. I said, well, I, I, what? You know, I was, I was like talking to you for a couple of minutes and then um, and then mm. we just got cut off. Yeah. So obviously there was some, we were caught in some sort of a loop. So I was listening to the same sort of three or four minute cycle. Like a now, recording of, of what it, she, so exactly. she hadn't repeated herself at all. She, she hadn't repeated herself at all. We just got cut off. But obviously somewhere was stored this conversation. Ooh, spooky. Um, and it was just like... Well, we should have, should have phoned, again, I don't know why you're phoning again. Mystery. You should have phoned John Sawyer yesterday on Nick's show yesterday, the former head of MI6. Oh, uh, yours, yours like, is the only show I listen to, James. Oh, fair enough. It sounds, like, <laughs> it's, it sounds like your phone is being tapped. Oh, dear. I'd hope not. Um, it sounds like your what? phone is being tapped. It sounds like your phone nice is being one. tapped. Yeah, oh, very good. So, so yeah, yeah. There I'm not going to say it again. I don't know there. if it would have been funny for me to say. It. So, 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 so it got recorded and it got played back to you again and again and again and again. To, to and yeah. r roughly how many times? Roughly five. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, half a dozen times. Yeah, okay. It was like, but basic, basically, it took me from walking, because I was walking through London, I walked from London Bridge to St Paul's along the river. Yeah, no, that's, um, quite, a, that's, quite, a, that's quite a distance, and it was definitely so a repetition. A um, Tim, yeah. it sounds like your phone's being tapped. Uh, I, I, well, I hope not. <laughs> it's, well, me too, but we'll find out. It's quarter to one. James O'Brien on LBC. Uh, 12.48 is the time. Questions still in need of answers. Uh, I, I, n nothing on the corner shops, unfortunately, so there's still time. How do corner shops make money? Does eating cold stuff or drinking cold stuff in cold weather warm you up? Is that the right answer? Is that the right question? In the same way that cold stuff, that hot stuff in hot weather cools you down. 
Yeah, got there in the end. Sorry about that. Uh, done that one. Done that one. Where do all the where did the late queen's clothes go, or, or indeed any senior royal? Uh, why do Farzana's birds not eat her suet pellets? I, I mean, do they know the difference in recipe or, or brand, or is it, it could be seasonal? Could it? And what happened to Tim's phone? Scott's in Penrith. Scott, question or answer? Ah, uh, it's a question, James. I can't believe I'm through to you. I wanted to. I wanted to ask this question for years. How many uh, years? I say years. No, no, it's probably a year. Just probably one a year. One year. Right. Go probably on. Probably a year. Yeah, but it's been being a fellow cheese lover. I'm hoping you might be able to I help me like, out. I, here, I so. do like a bit of cheese. I cannot like. Go you on. Know, yeah. What, what's what's up? Have you ever heard of uh, Kafili? Yeah, of course I have. Yeah, it's hard, hard yeah, cheese. It, it's just disappeared, like everywhere. Every supermarket practically overnight stopped selling it. Whether really? it be. All the all the big ones, Morrison's, uh, Sainsbury's, you just cannot find it anywhere anymore. You but it sure? used to be commercially sure everywhere. It? Really? Oh, I, I've, I've, done, I've done the nation. You can't find it in any of the big supermarkets. You can get it in like special cheese shops, yeah, and stuff like that. But you cannot find it. And um, just normal kefili, nothing like nothing special, not not like a special type of it. But just like with apricots in it or something cheese. like that. Or, yeah, but yeah. Just, your just, bo- just your regular bo- kefili, it's like Cheshire cheese, quite like Cheshire. Yeah, it is crumbly, you isn't it? It's quite it. crumbly. It is, yeah. Yeah, almost like a chalky cheese, really. But chalky cheese? It used to be everywhere. And now, did it? No Honestly, I, I mean, you, I've not tracked this, so you'd it would be like a ch- you'd be find it as easily as say a red Leicester or something like that. It would yeah. be in almost yeah, yeah. every every self respecting cheese aisle would have a care yeah. filly in it. Literally. And everywhere. now you've got to go. Uh, you've got to uh, go to specialist suppliers. Yeah, and I just wanted to know why. Why well, I do now as well. Yeah, I miss it. It's a pretty good cheese. It's, it's, it's sound quite plaintive there, mate. Can I mean? Can yeah. you not get hold of it anywhere? Is, have you not got a specialist? Oh, no, I, found, I have found it, James. I've done my I've done my homework. Good. You know, I found Do you get it delivered it. now? Do you get it on the dark uh, web? I, you I, can get, it, you can get it on the dark I'm web. I bet. You what? It now costs me about six pounds just for a little wedge of it. Now, but it's worth it. It's worth it, James. I, and I, well, I, 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 I'm trying to think what the answer might be. Is it? Is it since Brexit by any chance? Could it have stopped with Brexit? I no. think it was a bit after, no, it was after, it was after Brexit, but like, I, I always used to it might to have it a constituent, an ingredient that has to come in from overseas and it's made it more expensive to make. I mean, I'm trying to think of theories. So I, I used to live near North Wales, which yeah. obviously is more readily available that way, being closer to Wales. Um, and just every supermarket did sell it. Even, even like there was a commercial brand, I think they're called Dragon or something like that. They stopped selling it. And, it was like and, a and Welsh it's all gone. Company. It is literally, you cannot get it in any supermarket at all. Um, and the amount of people that have asked about it, and they're like, oh, yeah. And then they now realize you come they to, Now you come to mention it kind of thing. People are going, you're right, you know, you've got it. And people yeah. have got to stop sending me puns based on the word carefully as well, because it's so obvious. I'm not going to make that joke. It's, it, and nor is Scott. We're far too self-respecting to start making jokes about looking carefully or anything like oh, that. Oh, that's yeah, just, that's why. Well, I yeah, yeah. yeah. He I has been. Looking. He has been looking carefully. I have been. Yeah, for carefully. <laughs> I'll find out. Well, I, I just I'll tell you what. I should stop gassing and and get get the phone line free. Uh, Scott, take care. What's happened to all the carefully? Uh, Sam's in Gerald's Cross. Sam, question or answer? Oh, uh, hi, uh, James. It's an answer to convenience to survival. Yeah. Uh, yes. Good man. What have you got? Um, well, the there are. A few mix in um, in the pot. Um, uh, uh, the way one of the ways they deal with it uh, when the supermarkets run promotions, yes, like half price or lower price compared to the normal retail price. Yes, we buy and stock it, and then release the stock. Um, you know, um, on a piecemeal or you know on the normal basis. So Fair there enough. is a margin. Yep. Nice one. That one way, the margin. And also, you know, our margins are not high. So it's a basic survival, basic, you know, comparable, reasonably comparable to supermarket prices, but not very high. So you've got um, relatively small margins and the, the, it's staying open all hours, to coin a phrase, is, is really yeah. the secret. So some days you're probably going to be earning less than... You're not going to be earning a very good hourly rate, but because you're open all the time, it evens out over the course of the year. Over the year, yes, you're right. Yeah, spot on. I like that. Qualifications? 
I'm an accountant and I also used to run a an off license and uh, news agent. Why um, did you knock it on the head and to become an accountant? Better hours. Why, sorry, why did I? Right, give it up. Give up the shop to become an accountant. Better hours. No, I was an accountant before, but I thought, you know, just test the market on the retail sector. Okay. Uh, I tried it and it's too much for me, so I came out. Too much like hard work, Sam. It is hard work. And, uh, Get your feet up. Hours. Get a nice office job. Nice white collar bit of business as an accountant. <laughs> much easier. Although, yeah, of course, you can't go. watch the telly all day when you're an accountant like you can when you run a corner shop. Um, yeah, I suppose so, but it comes with all the um, flimsy things as well, isn't it? This, so, uh, swings and roundabouts. Swings and roundabouts, Sam. Have a round of applause. Thank you very much, Brad. Well, you take care. And can I take a privilege um, to say hi to the convenience store owners, please? Well, all of them. Um, all of them, and specific yeah. to the Sri Lankan Tamil community you are running. You can, but not one by one. Uh, okay, now just say you know, hi to Sri Lankan uh, Tamils uh, running the convenience stores. Right, fantastic. And if I bump into any, I'm at the cricket on Saturday, so if I bump into any, I'll say hello to them as well. Oh, please do, mate. I okay, will. Okay, thank you. Cheers, Good Sam. Time, thank you. Take care. Bye bye. Uh, 12, actually, I got a friend who's Sri Lankan who, who runs a convenience store. It runs the um, the budgeons in where near where I used to live. Actually, uh, so you live and learn. I wonder if Sam knew him. I should have checked. Peter's in Oxford. Peter, question or answer? I've got an answer, James. Carry on, Peter. It's in regards to the question about the suet pellets versus birdseed. Oh, yeah. And my theory and belief is that it's not so much about the brand of the suet pellets, but rather the seasonal instincts of the birds. Uh, because uh, birds will naturally change their diet depending on the food that's available in the wild. And things, you know, the, the flowers that would produce seed and the plants that produce seed, such as, you know, for instance, sunflowers or thistles, mm. that um, they're now dying off, the seeds are drying out, they're at the stage where the birds are going to be seeking those out naturally. Oh. Suet pellets are high in fat, and sometimes they even mix the insects in there and whatnot. And so the suet pellets are usually um, most uh, satisfying for birds in the winter and the spring when they need the nutrients. So the we should have checked with Farzana of uh, how long a period of time this experiment had been conducted shouldn't we agree or, or it could be the time that things are naturally changing and the birds are that's, what, that's what i mean that's what i mean yeah, if she'd yeah. been if she'd Indeed. been using them for two years and they'd been eaten regularly for two years and then it stopped when she changed recipes then my theory would work but if she's only been doing it for a relatively short amount of time then your theory works or maybe it's a longitudinal issue where she needs to do this survey over the course of years and note the date and the season at which that's the birds exactly what she over. needs to do. So I we fact, need more I'm, controls in the experiment. You're not wrong. In fact, it was quite amateurish, really, the the, the, the experiment that she described. Well, we, we're, we all start somewhere. Yeah, we do all start somewhere. Qualifications? Uh, absolutely none. I'm a avid bird watcher myself. That's and my it. Wife's That'll a do. Gardener, That's and I it. can see the birds. Uh, uh, no, no, it's cloudy and rainy today. But normally, they're, they're st I can see the sunflowers my wife planted, and the birds are starting to pick at them. So there you go. I bet you've done it. I'm going to give you a round of applause. I think you've oh, might. I, gift. No, I think you've nailed it. Go on. Thank you. <laughs> Paul's in Falkirk, um, or is Paul in Paulkirk? I don't know. Question or answer? It's an answer, James. Carry on, Paul. Paul. Uh, it's regards to the telephone oh, yeah. situation. Yes, uh, what generally tends to happen is I do a lot of overseas calls, right? And this happens on a regular basis when I'm doing overseas calls. Really? And what happens is, yeah, and what happens is the network jumps in and they repeat the conversation, and it's to keep you on the phone longer so that you're having to pay for the call more. Than what you should be. <laughs> no, it can't. Don't be serious. It can't be. That's what happens. I'm, no, I I'm, believe that it happens, but they're not doing it on purpose to prolong the length of the phone call. I don't know. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm not a hundred percent sure. Well, nor am you I. Know, how? I mean, the, how often? How many overseas phone calls do you make a year? Uh, a week? A month? Several. So, yeah. So several. I'm looking for a bit more specifics. Right. Okay. A hundred. A hundred a year. No, a hundred a month. A hundred a month. Is it business then? Yeah, I, I work in sales. And how many times out of that hundred would you get the repetition recording thing going on? Probably about five or six. That's quite a lot. Yep. But you've got absolutely and no basis for your conclusion that this is a, a profiteering scam being run by the phone company. This is what we've established. Who's as a we? Business. Who's we? 
the business that I work for. Aye, aye. Are so your calls are your calls being is... are your calls being re- recorded for training purposes? Oh, of course. Well, that's what's happened. Then is something wrong with your software? Nah, nah, nah. Your calls <laughs> are being recorded for training purposes. No, it's happened too many times. Your calls are being it. recorded for training purposes. No, nah, we've we, we've all discussed it, and uh, your calls are being recorded for training purposes. Well, you keep repeating yourself, so that's quite funny. Your calls. <laughs> <laughs> You got there in the end, Paul. I'm going to give you a round of applause, mate, but I don't think it can be that. That can't be what happened to um, whoever it was that rang in with that question. It was Tim, wasn't it? We've got two Tims today. It can't be what happened to Tim because it, it, it only happened once and it was it was rare. But lovely stuff, Paul. Thank you for playing. Um, I'm going to give the... I'm going to give it to Farzana, actually, I think, the uh, the Miss Jair ball game because she didn't get a proper... Well, she didn't know she did get an answer to her question. So I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to give it to Colin, because because we didn't find out about the Queen's clothes. So Colin gets the Miss Jow board game this week. 12.59 is the time. If you missed any of today's show, you can listen back on Catch Up on Global Player, where you'll also find all of LBC's shows to catch up on, as well as all of Global's live radio stations. So download Global Player for free from your app store or head to globalplayer.com. Tom Sawbrick will be with you at four. But now, on LBC, it's Sheila Fogarty. James O'Brien on LBC.